My name is Jane Guberman. Mm -hmm. Today is Thursday, October 20th, 2016. I'm here with Rabbi Everett Gendler, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Everett, do I have your permission to record this interview? You do. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, particularly in your, and especially your involvement in Chavara Shalom, and the impact that the Chavara has had on you personally, and on a larger Jewish community. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background a little bit, so we have a sense of who you were at the time that you got involved in the Chavara. So let's begin with your family. When you were growing up, you mm -hmm. were born in 1928. I was. In Iowa. Yeah. Can you tell me about your family when you were growing up? Sure. Um, yeah, I, it's not just I was born in Iowa. I mean, I was born in Sheraton, Iowa, which was, in my eyes, a quite sizable Iowa town of 5,000. But as the world measures, it was a bit of a hamlet. And, um, uh, but that's where we lived. And my, my family, and I'm thinking that this is a focus on Jewish background and such. My parents were very devoted Jews. Um, my mother maintained a kosher home, which meant um, when we had meat, it had been shipped in from Des Moines, and uh, how much of it we could eat depended on how effective the dry ice packaging was. We ate a lot of dairy in those years. Um, what had brought your family to Sheraton? Uh-huh. Well, um, my paternal grandparents had uh, come over from the Ukraine area back in the 1890s, and there was a bit of a, a de mini depression in the U.S., and they were told that there was a place for small peddlers out in the... Um, Swedish farming communities in the Midwest. So off they went, and um, they lived, I think, first in southern Minnesota. All my relatives lived in uh, small towns, Blue Earth, Mankato, Minnesota, um, and Sheraton, Albia, Somerville, uh, Centerville, Iowa. Um, anyway, um, my grandparents discovered that in the soft coal mining area of South Central Iowa, there, there were opportunities to uh, sell merchandise to the Welsh coal miners. So my paternal grandparents lived in Albia, a town of maybe 4,500, next county over. And um, I think my parents ended up in Sheraton because it was a place where they could open a general uh, a grocery store. And uh, my mother had been born, actually, in Oskaloosa, Iowa, which was a, a, a much larger city of maybe 10,000. Oskaloosa actually had a synagogue. Sheraton had either two or three Jewish families, depending on whether a local jeweler named Oppenheimer was or was not Jewish. It was never determined. But, uh, so, but my parents were very identified, and as I say, kept a kosher home. And for the high holidays, we would go to Alvia, and Jews from all the small towns would gather, and in a rented American Legion hall up on top of a shoe store. That's where they would hold, have holy day services. I, I don't know if you want more, but... Yeah, I, I just want to have a little bit more sense of um, what, oh. what it was like for you um, yeah. growing I, up as a Jewish boy in uh -huh. this environment. Okay, well, it was, that was till I was 11. And the, Let's, I just want to say in Sheraton for just a few Oh, minutes. in Sheraton. Um, I, um, basically, I, I was both part of the kids 
and I knew I was a little bit different. And that had a lot to do with uh, my parents' mixed feelings, ambivalence toward my full participation in um, the life of the local community. I'll give you an example. Uh, a Boy Scout troop was being formed and it was going to meet in a church basement. Interestingly, my, my parents were wary of this, so I did join. I did not join the Boy Scouts. At the same time, uh, I, I can remember when we were in Des Moines, several times, my mother would take us to midnight mass for the Christmas carols and the service. So it was, uh, so how was it? Um, for the most part, um, I experienced very little anti-Semitism, wh whatever that is. There may have been, there was one kid who didn't like me and he would like to taunt me with it. He'd say, Jewish Gene, my, my full name is Everett Eugene, and in Sheraton, uh, my nickname was Gene. Uh, I changed it to Everett when we moved to Des Moines. But um, apart from that, um, life was just kind of normal. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't celebrate Christmas or Easter, and nobody else celebrated Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or Hanukkah. But um, was um, it was it lonely in that sense for you? I suppose religiously it was, and I sometimes think that most of my <laughs> most of my life experiences have been have been uh, both blessed and compromised by marginality. And I almost feel as though that was part of my birthright, my gift inheritance. There, there was a, yeah, there was a touch of loneliness, a sense of being different. And uh, as, even as I reflect on my Jewish experiences subsequently, I think that is a particular characteristic. This was also farm country. Right? It was oh, a, yes. What, can you describe it? What, what did it look like? When you oh, were well, first of all, my mother hated farms. Uh, but we think she grew up a, out, a, on the edge of Oskaloosa on a, what looked like a pretty uh, meager bit of, of farm. A, my father, who had come over to this country when he was seven, from the Ukraine. My father loved farms. And even though we lived in Sheraton, we had a farm a few miles south of town, a 160-acre farm. That was the standard size in those years. And both my sister and I had ponies, Sweetheart and Ginger. And sometimes we would even, they, they would be trucked into town and I could ride my pony around Sheraton. That was wonderful. That was brought to an end when one day I fell off and uh, banged my head on the cement. And mother said, no more of that, ride in the country. But uh, so the memory that has really been formative for me, we lived in a quite modest house. Um, as I look back, I realize I, I grew up poor. I didn't know that at the time. It, it, think, it just seemed a bit meager. But um, about two blocks away was a railroad bridge. And of course, it was a big thrill when either the Burlington or Rock Island line, the Burlington Zephyr or the Rock Island rocket would come zooming through. No, no express train stopped in Sheraton, believe me. But when I went underneath that railroad bridge, that's where the cornfields began. And I used to love to look. And I would go down and 
I realize literally, I mean, they probably stretched uninterrupted to St. Joseph, Missouri, north of Kansas City. Wow. And the Iowa countryside was gently rolling and to my eyes still very beautiful and rich. And uh, as I say, my father loved farms. He didn't do farming, but he loved the earth. And uh, that, that has stayed with me, though there were periods when it was in occultation, as they say. <laughs> But, you know, at the University of Chicago and all that, but... Um, These were the Depression years. They were. How did that affect your family? <clears throat> well, we, we'd maintained a pretty decent standard of living when, when my parents had the grocery store, but what happened was that uh, a, lot, a lot of the business was from coal miners. Uh, incidentally, from Lucas, Iowa, just nine miles away, John L. Lewis was born in Lucas, Iowa. Anyway, a lot, a, a lot of the trade was with coal miners and farmers, and so they'd ask for credit. Uh, how can you not give credit to somebody who's buying milk for his kid? Long and short of it, eventually, after, after many, the, during the Depression, they lost the store. And uh, so then my father and his brother peddled eggs for a while, and then they had a used car lot, and we had a small dairy, pa milk pasteurizing plant in our backyard, and so they, he sold milk and eventually uh, went in with a couple of shady characters, a, a limestone crushing, and, uh, and then he remained in that the rest of his life. Ultimately did well, but uh, uh, those were, w when, when he had a used car lot, sometimes Sunday afternoon, the big treat would be that uh, we would go for a ride uh, my, uh, with my sister and I in the back seat. Uh, I guess with my sister and me in the back seat. <laughs> um, and um, the car that was selected was one that had a little bit of residual gasoline in the tank. And Sometimes we'd say, ooh, could we stop for an ice cream cone? And de literally, depending on weather, there, between my parents, they could find a spare 10 cents to buy two five-cent cones. Uh, we would either enjoy our ice cream cones or maybe next week. I, I think, you know, that, that's... That's probably one memory uh, of many. You mentioned um, when we were getting ready, uh, re you were remembering listening to the radio. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, part of the excitement in Sheraton was to listen to broadcasts of the Chicago Cubs or the Pittsburgh Pirates or the St. Louis Browns, you should pardon the expression, and, uh, and the Cardinals. But um, also once in a while, on a, maybe even somewhat regularly on a Sunday afternoon, we would uh, tune in to a, a large transmitter out of Chicago, WGN. Colonel McCormick's world's greatest newspaper radio arm. And Sunday afternoons, uh, there would be broadcasts of Father Coughlin from Detroit, whose anti-Semitic rhetoric was barefaced right out there and uh, makes any excesses today look quite moderate and restrained. So, I mean, I would be listening and he would be talking about 
Jewish plots, and uh, I was totally puzzled. I didn't know of any. I didn't know what he was talking about, but uh, there it was. Yeah. So life changed when you were 11. Your family moved to Des Moines. Moved to Des Moines. Why was that? I think, <clears throat> I, I think my mother particularly had the feeling that uh, as my sister and I were growing toward adolescence, it, it would, would be important to have other Jewish kids around. And uh, we, we went, actually, we went first just as an experiment for Yom Kippur services at the, uh, the big conservative synagogue in Des Moines. And as, as I think back, I realize uh, that may have been the first synagogue building I had ever been in. I mean, I'd been to the, you know, these Orthodox services at High Holy Days, and we had a lot of Jewish observance in our home. Where were the services, though? High holiday services. Oh, those were in that rented American Legion Hall in Albany, Albia, because um, my grandparents were quite pious. <clears throat> Though I, I have to say, you know, the piety did not um, prevent them from having their stores open on Saturdays. You didn't have much choice. Sunday's stores were closed, and if you wanted to do commerce. So um, anyway, um, we went to the, to the synagogue and uh, it was a big conservative synagogue and it had an organ and a choir loft, a mixed choir. And uh, when we moved to Des Moines, we were about three blocks from the synagogue. So it, it was an easy place to become involved with both because of proximity, but also because the rabbi was young and lively and politically engaged, and the youth group was about the most interesting place in town. So I would say, yes, things changed very much when we moved to Des Moines, and all of a sudden there was Hebrew school. Had you had any Jewish education to that point? Only what I had learned in, at home, and when my mother's father would come for periodic visits, and he would then teach me to read Hebrew with the wrong pronunciation, so that when I came to Des Moines, it was an object of scorn and amusement in the Hebrew school class. What do you mean wrong pronunciation? I mean, we, we would, uh, in standard Ashkenazit, you would say Baruch Ato, or in Sephardic Baruch Ata, for whatever reason, and it is a particular accent. Uh, I grew up, uh, to the extent I learned any of it, Burich, Burich Ato. So, you know, the O was, became U, and uh, the U became I. And there is such an, I don't know if it's Galician or something. Um, but so that, that basically was my Jewish education until we moved to Des Moines. Just, that's one reason that I ended up with a six-year remedial sentence at Jewish Theological Seminary. <laughs> How did you take to the Jewish education once you got to Des Moines that you were getting? Oh, I I liked it a lot. It was it was interesting, and uh, I I I loved religious school. I even for a, a short period of time um, after I was bar mitzvah, I I even went to the daily minion, and uh, liked it a lot. It didn't, it didn't stick. I've never been a davener, and that certainly affected my whole relationship to Chavarat Shalom later. But um, the youth group used to have discussions about politics and Zionism and the World War, 
uh, and uh, all, all of that. It, it was livelier than anything else I knew in Des Moines, with one addition. When I was later along in high school, I, uh, through a, some radio exchange with a high school in London, I, I met some of the people at the, the local American Friends Service Committee. And uh, I just uh, quickly felt a kinship of spirit and value so that um, along with uh, the joy of Jewish education and our tradition and the observances now with community, I also um, felt a, a deep ethical kinship with the Friends, the Quakers. What appealed to you about their vision of I, the world? <clears throat> I, I had always been um, really moved by Isaiah, Amos, um, and I suppose what you could call the peaceable passages of Hebrew scripture. It, it spoke to my spirit. And of course, the Quaker testimony was a peace testimony, so that uh, I, I could feel uh, a kind of confirmation of inner feelings that were less uh, less affirmed in the Jewish community, and uh, you know, and the uh, there have been some pacifist figures in the Jewish tradition, but. Uh, not well known. I, I'm, I've been trying to work on now uh, having some of Rabbi Aaron Samuel Tamaris uh, become more prominent and more of his writings translated. I've got a bunch of stuff. I'm working on it now, fitfully, irregularly, di discontinuously. But anyway, the, 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 the Quakers um, were companions with that and remained so for decades. Yeah. yeah. So, moving forward, yes. in, a, in a brief autobiographical essay <laughs> that from 2002, you called your undergraduate years at the University of Chicago amazing eyes, ears, and spirit opening years. Wow. You did. Really? I mean, I would agree. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, University of Chicago in those days was simply terrifying and totally engaging. I mean, I, 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 I came from Des Moines and Theodore Roosevelt High School. Um, what were the years that you were at the University of Chicago? Was I was there from uh, 46 to 51. Okay. Um, it was just after the Second World War. So along with um, a number of students from the East Coast who obviously ha had a much greater acquaintance with classic Western traditions than did I. Along with them were a lot of guys on the GI Bill. And they came not only with that additional knowledge, but with uh, a fund of experience that, please God, may it not be repeated. So it was a startling and electrifying, a challenging place. And you know, to have ideas taken so seriously and to have them discussed with such passion was uh, quite unprecedented. I mean, we, we had nice discussions at our youth group in Des Moines, but nothing like that. The, the other special feature was 
that the Hillel Foundation on campus at that time was maybe the single most significant gathering place, generally speaking, you know, outside of sororities and um, athletic stuff. And there was an extraordinary elf of a man, Maurice Pekarsky, maybe you've heard the name. Uh, he was the director, small, quizzical fellow. Um, you could never get an answer from him on anything, always another question. It was inspiring, aggravating at periods of deep spiritual crisis, really sort of profoundly disappointing, but that was Maurice. But, I mean, he, he invented the, uh, what became a classic debate, the, the annual Lotke versus the Hamantash debate. And he had, I mean, people who had nothing to do with Judaism but w would participate. I mean, the nominal Jews. I mean, Daniel Borstein, who In later... Debate, you mean? It, yeah, they'd participate. Can you say it, what the debate is? Oh, it would have to do with is the Lotke or the Hamantash superior. And, you know, so a mathematician might give it this twist, and a sociologist would uh, give it this twist, etc. Sometimes they would remark on the geometric shape, sometimes on the accompanying holiday. But what was extraordinary was the range of people. I mean, Daniel Bell, who at one time was a quite prominent intellectual figure. I mean, when he was at Chicago, he would participate. And as I say, Daniel Bernstein, Leo Strauss would offer study groups at the Hillel. Um, and uh, Hans Morgenthau, maybe less so, but he would turn up. Uh, so Hillel was a, an amazing intellectual hotbed. How and about the spiritual um, context for your own development? Yeah. Um, I, I continued to probe Jewish tradition. Buber was not yet so prominent or easily available as, as in a few years, but he was coming into prominence. So tales of the Hasidim were uh, of great influence. So I, I continued my contact with the, the Quakers and would annually attend a, a, confer, a week's conference at Avon Old Farms in Connecticut, Quaker Approaches to Contemporary Affairs. I had attended one when I was in my in high school that was held at William Penn College. I run, interestingly enough, in Oskaloosa, Iowa, my mother's hometown, though I'm sure she didn't know of it when she was growing up. But um, at that time, I think, um, Clarence Pickett of the American Friends Service Committee, but also um, some other Quaker thinkers and devotionalists also influenced me so that uh, some appreciation of silence uh, became for me increasingly important. And I, I can remember you know, appreciating at Hillel both the group singing and the spirit, but also at times withdrawing into uh, silence and sometimes wishing there were a bit more of it at the communal level. But it was it was turbulent also in that. Um, I mean. At Chicago in those days, end of the Hutchins era, 
specialization was not permitted at the undergraduate level. You better not know what you wanted to do. And um, I mean, I was very interested in the rabbinate, but um, issues of faith and doubt and uh, existence of God really, really had pained effect. And um, so there was that as well. You mentioned that your college years were in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Yeah. What impact had the war and the <clears throat> realization of what had been the fate of East European Jewry and then the founding of the State mm. of Israel all happened sort of during this period? What impact did that on you and your sense of self? <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I felt a, a, a tremendous struggle, a, a, really a conflict, both during the, uh, the latter stages of the Second World War. I was torn, the, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Nazi monstrosity was totally beyond the bounds of acceptability. But the, the mass destruction wrought by the defenders of my civilization was also simply unconscionable. And um, <clears throat> I am, it's, ah, who can say after the fact? I don't know. It, it was never an issue because I was too young um, to have to register for the draft. But I was very much inclined toward conscientious objection with the sense that maybe that just cannot be in the face of the, the Nazi machine. And uh, look, at, for those who live with hindsight, it remains a, a live issue. I, I can only imagine that maybe I would have uh, felt moved to, to register. Maybe I would have felt moved to ask for alternative service. And some of my closest later pacifist friends had served in the, in the Air Force in World War II, and after that were absolute that no more destruction of that kind for any imaginable reason. Israel, um, I mean, I was a really... Uh, supportive, excited by it, but I, I thought of it more as a refuge for Jews in need, never as intimation of redemption. And I still do not recite the prayer on behalf of the nation, state, power, political entity called Israel when it talks about the beginning of the burgeoning of our redemption. Reshit tzmichat geulatenu. What? I mean, uh, no. And, and uh, even early, while I was at University of Chicago, I worried about what seemed to me a uh, a new idolatry called the worship of the land. As I say, uh, a necessary refuge, yes. The necessity of the refuge representing defeat for the highest human aspirations. Or let's say, not defeat, further postponement. Um, so it, it was turbulent, it was painful. Uh, 
I, my socialist tendencies, I, I developed those in high school. Ed, Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, you know, the utopian novel, oh, oh. <laughs> right up there with the prophets. And Reb Chaim David Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, whom I later included in the liturgy, you know, HD, uh, uh, Reb Chaim Dovel, uh, our, our, new, <laughs> our New England predecessor. Uh, so you mentioned that you had entertained the idea of becoming a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And in 1957, you graduated from the Jewish I, Theological Seminary. I did. How did you actually <coughs> decide to become a rabbi? How, how what? How did you decide actually to pursue the rabbinate? What, what was what called to you about that? I, <clears throat> well, um, the, the path of pursuit was somewhat <laughs> circuitous as I look. Um, you know, uh, I, I was drawn to it because uh, what, a, what a wonderful way to deal with these pressing questions of commitment, of worldview, of outlook, of the meaning of life, of why we're here, etc. And on the other hand, all of the questions about but what is the reality of God and where and how, how account for the lack of intervention? I mean, wonderful, wonderful, thanks God for the exodus, but what have you done for us recently and all that? And you know, the, the whole, Heschel had not yet come along with his um, theology of pathos and Bonhoeffer with the uh, real articulation of um, the limitations of deity by virtue of human creation. And um, so my desire to, to do stuff like this was so problematic that I actually at one point decided if, if I want to deal with this, better that I do it through the medium of social work. And sort of wandering, I, I, after, after the, the college, I'd, I'd done some graduate work in philosophy and then I almost went into history of music, but I didn't. And I then, spent a year of the two-year program in the Graduate School of Social Work, had a field work placement three days a week in the back of the yards movement in the stockyard area, and uh, that was certainly a powerful human experience. But I, I, I found that ultimately, I mean, it was valuable and so, what can I say? It was so prosaic and so lacking in depth, reflection, social work. And it was so much uh, mechanical and even where it was humanly oriented, it would be addressing uh, the most basic of material needs, but the deep questions that I was struggling with were rem totally unaddressed. So what was your experience of rabbinical school and why, why JTS as opposed to... Let's ah, say, why JTS, ABC? yeah. Because basically um, I, had, I had been become identified with what I knew of the conservative movement. Now, <laughs> Uh, the, the temple in Des Moines was high church reform. And uh, with, uh, now, I mean, at our, at our synagogue, we had the uh, organ, the choir, uh, and I realized, you know, uh, 
the organist was not Jewish. A third or a half of the choir was not Jewish. Um, and uh, we, we sang, we used hymns from the Union Hymnal. This was, this was this brand of Midwestern conservative, which it, frankly is, uh, less tr was less traditional than m standard reform services this was, today. This was for, in the mid-40s. Oh, United Synagogue. Synagogue. You know, <coughs> <coughs> so basically, I went to JTS by virtue of momentum. That, that had been the movement I was involved with. Um, the seminary was both wonderful and very difficult. <coughs> it was wonderful in the quality of instruction and the level of intellectual life. <clears throat> and, um, I mean, Saul Lieberman was formidable and incredible, I mean, you know. Uh, <clears throat> a master of an entire body of Greek and Latin literature and Talmud and Tosefta and I mean oh, Louis Ginsburg was still there and encyclopedic understates the the scope of his mind and the wit and the sharpness of him uh, uh, Shalom Spiegel the most eloquent uh, teacher I've ever had. Abraham Halkin, oh, a paragon of learning and strict honesty and grammatical precision. Ah, uh, I mean, when he would read Torah, you could tell the difference between a Shivana and a Shivanach between a vocalic and a quiescent shiva. <laughs> um, and, oh yeah, I mean, there were other scholars. I, 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 a little harder to take. Uh, Boaz Cohen was a lovely man, but Codes was, it was so tedious. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost ashamed. I mean, I used to, I found it so soul-numbing that I used to sit in Code's class, and behind the text, I would be reading Quaker devotional literature. So, um, uh, the the Heschel was there; that he was a lifeline. But uh, the seminary was so wonderful intellectually. And so remote in terms of nourishing the spirit. And I, I don't want to get into these divisions, bifurcations, and, uh, and spirituality can be nebulous and vague and blah, blah, a blah term, but it does point to something. It does point to the cultivation of the inwardness. And I found Finkelstein himself embodied some of that. I mean, I really felt uh, a spirituality about him and his breadth of vision. I mean, he established Institute for Religious and Social Studies. We, we students, we were, were so narrow, I mean, on Tuesdays when the Institute would meet at the seminary and there would be hundreds of, of clergy, Catholics and Protestants, you know, studying with rabbis. Uh, and we used to say, oh my God, here comes G day, G for Goy. And, and here's Finkelstein who was, you know, decades ahead in terms of vision. 
Finkelstein also, you know, enlisted Harlow Shapley, an astronomer at uh, Harvard, and MacIver, a sociologist at Columbia, and others of real standing in those years to um, begin to address the relations of religion and science, religion and social science. So Finkelstein was a visionary, but it that didn't it didn't um, it didn't finally translate into um, how we lived our religious lives. And there was one point in my studies there, and there had been some personal issues and relational crises and blah, 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 blah. But there was one point at which I asked for a one-year leave of absence, during which I took just um, one or two courses, one with Shalom Spiegel, and I think one with a crazy Hungarian, Abraham Schreiber, who was kind of adjunct faculty, uh, a great esthete and a, a great uh, text scholar. And uh, during that year, I focused on elementary harmony and counterpoint and began el piano lessons. I, I needed a respite from words, and, and I needed a refuge from concepts, and I, I needed a different dimension of experience. And uh, I, w I was also in um, psychoanalysis at the time. I had a, a Viennese trained lay analyst which meant affordable. And I went three to four times a week. Classic, on the couch, free association. Unfortunately, I had no remembered dream fragments to work with. But, um, and I found my way back to um, finishing up at seminary, and... Uh, so by the time you were ordained, and yes. were beginning this next period, another decade of uh, your first uh, pulpits, yeah. uh, what was your vision for yourself as a rabbi? And <clears throat> um, you also worked in a variety of different places, from Latin America to Princeton, New Jersey, yeah. and how did you decide what direction to pursue in these early years? Uh, um, well, Mexico came about. At that time, um, there was uh, uh, the understanding that um, those of us in theological schools who, who had a draft exemption uh, because uh, of divinity status. This is during the Korean War you're talking about. During the Korean War. Or, to be technical, the Korean peace, po police action. I think it was never a declared war, which of course has become the custom since in once constitutional USA, but never mind. <laughs> um, so um, we were expected to spend two years in the military chaplaincy. and. Uh, I felt that I, I really could not, in good conscience, serve as a morale officer in uniform. I offered a to um, serve two years, uh, but as a civilian, uh, the military was not having any of that. I offered to do two years at a Quaker work camp outside the country. The rabbinical assembly felt that, ah, what a waste. And so there was this small congregation in Mexico City that couldn't afford a rabbi, a small English-speaking liberal congregation. 
and I ended up doing serving two years there um, with uh, my salary equal to that of a military chaplain, but without post-exchange privileges. No, can't win them all. And uh, so that, uh, that was a sort of my alternative to the military chaplaincy. <coughs> The, the full truth, why did I go to Rio de Janeiro? I'd come back and was, at the, at the end of my Mexican experience, which had been marvelous, wonderful, horizon expanding and turbulent and painful and a thousand things, um, I, I, enrolled in a, a graduate program in history and philosophy of religions, a joint program at Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary. And during that doctoral program, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, was, I was also involved at the seminary. Finkelstein had engaged me as um, a Herbert Lehman Fellow and I was an advisor to students. I used to run an underground spiritual minion. You know, because I had remembered uh, the spiritual undernourishment when I had been a student. And Finkelstein recognized the need for that and really asked me to do that. He was, he was, an amazingly complex figure for whom I have deep affection. Anyway, um, full disclosure. So I go to see a, a film called Black Orpheus, Orfeo Negro. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's a Brazilian film, <gasps> filmed in Rio. <gasps> I mean, um, magical. A gorgeous woman is, is one of the leads in the scenery of Rio. And um, shortly after, I see on the bulletin board at JTS, um, summer and holo high holiday position with the liberal synagogue in Rio de Janeiro. So that is the, that was my called to Rio. <laughs> and uh, listen, I can't take too much of your time, but uh, quite a city. That's the call. Anyway, um, so um, it turned out that actually it worked out so engagingly in Rio that um, they asked me to stay. They actually, as I discovered subsequently, being one faction of this massive congregation. I was the assistant rabbi and I was to work with the youth, and, but I did some preaching. And, uh, but it, um, my Portuguese improved rapidly and I was preaching in Portuguese, which was both very positive and had the unfortunate secondary effect of making myself comprehensible to people. Whoa. Anyway, long and short of it, um, uh, my f uh, in November I needed to, uh, I, I asked for 10 days off because my father was quite ill and I, I wanted to come visit him. And they took me to the airport and, oh, Senora, we can hardly wait for you to return and we are, I mean, embraces and so on. And when I get off at JFK, there is, uh, which in those days was Idlewild Airport, I get off at Idlewild, uh, uh, I am paged and there's a telegram. It had been dispatched from the airport as I was boarding the plane. Oh, Senor. Uh, uh, do not buy your return ticket 
until you hear further from us. And what I heard further from them was basically, um, we'll arrange to have your belongings packed and shipped to you, and we think it would be in your interest and the congregation's interest that uh, we here cease our work together. So um, I wasn't exactly tossed out, but uh, <laughs> had I not gone home but for other reasons, I might have been tossed. Anyway, and that that's a whole other issue. But I ended up in Princeton because, uh, so I went back to work on my doctorate. And um, Wolf Kelman said, there's an opening in Princeton and that would be just ideal for you. It's an unaffiliated congregation. Realize up to that time I'd never served a United Synagogue congregation, nor have I ever. Probably had I, I, I had a broader vision, probably Jewish Institute of Religion would have been right for me. Uh, but I didn't know at the time. The decade in which uh, you began your career was, <clears throat> the, was a truly momentous one. It was the 60s. Oh, yes. And you were very involved <clears throat> in many aspects of the changes that were taking place in American society through the civil rights movement, the anti war <clears throat> movement. Can you talk about what you consider to be the highlights of that period in your life and the, and the formative influences that shaped mm. how you uh, navigated your way through these tremendous changes? Yeah. You know, uh, um, I, I, some people, I think, really managed to live their lives directed by a sense of precise purpose. When, when I look back, um, I, I find that I've, I've had a vague purpose, but almost everything has been circumstantial or guidance and um, depends on your framework. I think both Mary and I have a very strong sense of having been guided, of being guided. But, so, um, I, I was, um, I had resumed my doctoral program and I'd finished the coursework and taken the qualifying exams and Wolf Kelman gets a hold of me one day and says, um, I've got the post for you. Uh, he says, Princeton, New Jersey. He says, you can go. It'll, it'll be your kind of congregation. It's, it's mixed, but you would be just right for it. It's a good academic setting. You can work on your dissertation Continue your doctoral, I mean, you're finished with all the coursework. You just select your dissertation, work on it. You'll be able to combine that with congregational work, and it'll be just right. 1st of August, 1962, I move into the house of the, uh, of the congregation, and uh, I have some furniture from a small furnished apartment in New York, but it hasn't come yet, and I'm in a sleeping bag on the floor, and I get a call from a friend, Cy Dresner, um, and he says, oh, he says, Dr. King is having a real problem down in Albany, Georgia, because um, Chief Laurie Pritchett is very restrained, very proper, and the movement is at a standstill, and he's asked if some clergy f from the North will come down and engage in a prayer vigil next week. I say, sigh, man. I'm sleeping on the floor. I'm waiting for my furniture to come. Next weekend is my first um, service in my new congregation. 
Uh, I say, I don't think I can do it. He says, look, you'll take a plane out Sunday. Monday we'll meet. Tuesday is the demonstration. Wednesday you're on a plane back. Nobody will know. Have your furniture delivered on Thursday. At and I realized um, that was really, uh, will my feet, follow my mouth, or will they not? And, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, conscientious objector, you know, alternative service in Mexico, and here is somebody explicitly dedicated to nonviolence and minimizing injury to the opponent even while engaging in a struggle for justice. I mean, how, how can I not go down? So I went down and it was really interesting because that demonstration got postponed for a day or so, so I was in on the intimate planning and had you know, a lot of contact with King and Wyatt Walker. And, uh, yeah. and Andy Young was of course there and uh, all, the, all the people. Well, turned out that um, when we engaged in the prayer vigil on Wednesday in front or Thursday, whatever day in front of the courthouse, um, Chief Pritchett said, um, "Do you have a permit for assembly?" And uh, said, "No, you don't need a permit for." a public assembly in front of a courthouse, and long and short of it, about 90 of us were arrested, and we were taken to the uh, Albany courthouse, and there, I mean, we'd, we'd been arrested together, but then we were resegregated, and half of us were shipped to the Lee County Stockade, where the, one of the places where they used to house the old chain gangs. And half of us were transported to the Terrell County Stockade. And uh, we were there two plus days. I mean, there, there had been no contingency planning at that point. And um, we, those of us um, in the white stockade were, um, we felt that we were unjustly there, and we felt that, I mean, we would sleep, but we would not have any food, so we, we were on hunger strike, uh, you know, trying to uh, instruct the jailers about what we felt was the injustice of it. And, uh, so, um, so I missed my... <laughs> I missed my first Friday night service in Princeton and uh, missed the baby naming. The family was certainly forgiving. And uh, so that was my introduction to uh, uh, the congregational life in Princeton. There was, um, there was immense support from the congregation generally and there was one man who resigned because he, he felt that King had associations with various leftist groups and he didn't want a rabbi who consorted with the likes of King. He was actually quite an active member of the John Birch Society, but... Um, Nonetheless, you did <laughs> continue to consort. Yeah, so, so that was um, my introduction to the... I mean, the personal introduction to King, you know, whom I admi had admired before. Mm -hmm. And then I kept in touch with the movement, and it was at that point that um, <clears throat> we were at the Rabbinical Assembly in the Catskills in six, May of 63, headlines in the New York Times and photos of the police dogs and the fire hose and, the, you know, the little kids. And, so. 
and uh, Heschel was there, and I'd been in touch with people in the movement and asked if they might welcome a rabbinic delegation, and they were just thrilled. So from the rabbinical assembly, 19 of us flew down to, um, <clears throat> to Birmingham and um, were there for two, three days, you know, just what, whatever the movement wanted us to do. And um, Birmingham was actually a lot scarier than Albany, Georgia had been. Um, the police chief in Albany, had, uh, Laurie Pritchett, had been quite restrained and proper. Everyone knew of Bull Connor and uh, the excesses in Birmingham. But Birmingham was also a, a more thoroughly segregated city, ironically because um, Albany, Georgia had been an old southern town where people's black help lived very nearby. Birmingham was an industrial city, steel particularly, and other industry. And there you could have the workforce segregated, come to the factory during the day, go home at night. And Birmingham is where when they met us at the airport, uh, they had a caravan and we were divided up and one uh, one black driver and three of us in each car and at certain intersections as we approached them we were told bend down below window level because there are snipers and any car that comes by with mixed colors will take a take a shot so birmingham i went down to birmingham and then um then it um turned out that um later that autumn um i was invited to by the an NAACP chapter in Oklahoma City to come talk and uh, I did, and a friend of mine was rabbi at the big conservative temple in Kansas City. He said, look, you come from Oklahoma City, you can either fly straight back to Newark or you take one hop up to Kansas City and from there you head back to Newark. Come talk at my congregation. So I did that. That's where I met Mary. And um, so we sometimes say, King was our shadchan. And, yeah. and then uh, in 65, after we were married, Mary and I went down for the second of, of the aborted Selma marches. We weren't there for the triumphant march. I figured by then it was solved and who needed me. So um, I was very involved with constantly with King and I would be on the phone and um, got to know Wyatt Walker pretty well, mostly by phone, and I knew Andy Young a little bit and yeah, met quite a number of the people. Um, I sometimes say that um, I, I had been intending to do a dissertation on some aspect of social justice for my doctorate, but uh, in lieu of the doctorate and my dissertation, I ended up involved with with the civil rights movement. So, you know, there was a professor of theology at Pittsburgh University, who uh, no, at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, who lived in Princeton and had difficulty renting an apartment. So we had a small, we had a, uh, some activity on the front of Princeton housing, you know, the town, etc. And meanwhile, here was Vietnam, and, you know, a calamity for the poor Vietnamese, 
but also a very great tragedy in that one of the f most ruthless but most dedicated political leaders we ever had, Lyndon Johnson, who did more for civil rights and in this country than anyone ever had, was of course, alas, derailed by that. Anyway, so I used to do draft counseling and, um, but I guess that was a little later. We, the, no, that's, yeah, that's when I was doing that. And, uh, and um, I did draft counseling. The, the Princeton clergy were um, supportive of expressions of conscience and we even had organized with the dean of the Princeton Chapel uh, a public demonstration at which young men could, if they felt so moved, turn in their draft cards and we would accept them. But then it seemed that uh, the Princeton Chapel was in fact not available that particular time and uh, so we ended up having the public demonstration at Palmer I Square. I want to ask you to just sort of try and articulate what, what for you were the greatest lessons that you took and internalized from your involvement in the civil rights movement and the oh. anti-war movement, and then we'll move on to the Chabad Rock. Yeah. Um, I, I think the... Uh, the major lesson that, that I, I derived was the political power of wisely applied nonviolence. Did it totally transform the U.S.? No. Did it make big differences in our society? The, the king and the nonviolent movement, huge. I mean, one year I was traveling to Atlanta and I knew that uh, Andrew Young was at that point in jail. Four or five years later, I'd fly to Atlanta for a rabbinical assembly convention and there is a greeting at the airport, welcome from mayor. Andrew Young, <laughs> that's change. Yeah, I mean, not total societal transformation. And I think actually the, uh, I mean, it's arguable, but I do think that the political pressure of middle class resistance to the draft and to the uh, continuing and some growing Vietnam destruction, I think that helped stop it. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that briefly is what I would say. Okay. So let's turn that yeah. focus on the <laughs> So in the meantime, also, you and Mary, as you said, had gotten married. You had two small daughters at that point. Uh, um, let me think. No, actually, uh, no, um, uh, Tamar was born actually in, uh, I think in... 65? Uh, 65, yeah, right. We had one. Naomi wasn't born till the summer of 68 when we had moved to Cuernavaca. Right. So you got involved with the Chabara when you came back. Right. When and, when and how did you first become aware of the Chabara and its notion well, of creating this? Yeah, yeah. Culture? Well, I mean, I, we were around in 68. I, I had been close to Reb Zalman for some years. Uh, I had invited him once or twice to Princeton. Where did you first know him? Um, at some point, and I don't even remember when, uh, I was invited up to uh, speak, I think, at the Hillel Foundation in, uh, in uh, um, 
Manitoba, up where where he was living in Canada at the time. Um, but where did I meet Zalman? I'm not. I'm not even sure. But I met him, you know, very early, and. Um, Did I know him before? Well, I certainly uh, knew of him when I was in Princeton. Whether I knew of him when I was in Mexico earlier, I don't know. I but don't... certainly by the time you got involved in the Chabarat, he was... Oh, sure. Uh, uh, so I was around for some of the preliminary planning. I had... Uh, you knew Art Green? Uh, Art, I knew Art uh, from his testimony. I, I helped Art survive JTS. And uh, so we were very close. And, you know, he would come to spend a weekend in Princeton and uh, enjoy our home hospitality and be encouraged by the prospect of finishing JTS and actually beginning to exercise some uh, spiritual guidance provided to the community after, after tending one's own. So I knew both of them was involved a little in preliminary discussions, but we had... Um, after six years in Princeton, that felt like about enough. And then there were growing tensions. Um, I mean, I, I had some congregants who were active with the Department of Defense and who used to commute to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So the Vietnam stance was difficult. I uh, was not among those who cheered the um, triumph of the 68 Six-Day War, or 67, whenever, 67, 67 Six-Day War. And my uh, Yom Kippur sermon was like all, Kachol Hagoyim, like all the nations, reflections on Jews, Judaism, and Zionism in which I articulated immense relief and gratitude that Jews in the state of Israel were safe and terrible misgivings about the potential of it becoming imperial Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And that also was uh, a bit controversial. So anyway, we were we were leaving Princeton, and um, at the time, we were close to Father Dan Berrigan, and I was also quite close to Dave Dellinger, one of the Chicago Seven. And uh, Dan was saying, you ought to go to Cuernavaca. Ivan Ilyich is running a, a radical study center there. Uh, he, he was... Um, an oddball Catholic bishop. And um, so that's where we went. Naomi was born. And uh, partly because of, of Dellinger and Berrigan, I got an invitation to Cuba. And the, there was no rabbi there, but still five congregations operating. Wolf Kalman managed to uh, talk to someone who had influence, and I received State Department authorization to travel. And um, it was awkward. Mary couldn't come because we had two. I mean, Tamar was three, and Naomi was six weeks old. But I went to Cuba for a month in the autumn, and then again around Passover in the spring. and. To, wrote several articles, and my, uh, after the articles were published, my application for a third visa from the State Department was rejected. So 
never mind. So how you, you were so we, how you first sort of heard about Kavarat Shalom? Yeah, well, so I knew Art and um, Art and Zalman were planning it. And when our year was nearing an end in Cuernavaca, um, uh, I had uh, I'd been invited to a residency at Packard Mance. What uh, was Packard Mance? Packard Mance was a um, a sort of social action center. It was um, an an endowed retreat center in uh, I think on Plain Street in Stoughton, right next to Sharon. Stoughton, Massachusetts. Yes, Stoughton, Massachusetts. And it was interracial, um, interreligious, headed by a Baptist lay theologian and with um, uh, an Episcopal priest in residence and a, a Catholic priest in residence who had been recently released from jail in Milwaukee for an action. and. Uh, they were looking for a, a Jewish presence, and uh, I had spoken in Boston earlier, and I was invited to uh, for a two-year appointment as a resident fellow there. So, um, knowing of the Chavura in Somerville, and now this invitation to a house in the woods in Stoughton, but we also had a house in Roxbury, and uh, it felt like the ideal position you know, from which to continue social engagement while also having the opportunity to have some connection with Chabarat Shalom, though you, geography mm -hmm. posed some problems. How, how would you describe your, your, your personal sort of Jewish identity, sense of Jewish identity at that time? Hmm. Um, certainly uh, experimentally oriented. I mean, I used to conduct Friday night services during the summer in Princeton out of doors. And uh, I, I used to include in the service, as I say, excerpts from Thoreau and D.H. Lawrence and Reb Mayor Rilke and uh, others of that kind. So I, I was looking for ways to um, freshen Jewish religious expression. Um, I was, I didn't feel particularly part of any organized Jewish movement, just um, open to the sense of the need for development and experimentation and uh, reconnecting with uh, the spiritual wellsprings. What appealed to you particularly about the vision of Chavarat Shalom as it was being presented? Uh, well, it, it <clears throat> you know, it, Chavarat Shalom had an essential tension between Chavarat Shalom community seminary and Chavarat Shalom community seminary. I appreciated uh, the combining of those elements of community interpersonal relationships with um, theological seriousness and a study of Jewish texts. Um, I I liked the people. Uh, I had enormous affection and respect for Zalman and Art. I mean, they uh, uh, we had our differences, but um, they were paragons in my eyes. And the thought of um, you know participating with these marvelous young people in this experiment was just greatly appealing, except it was very difficult because we were 45 minutes from there. Right. What, what did you, um, 
understand yourself to be committing to? You were, you, you were recruited as faculty, essentially? I was recruited as faculty, essentially, but of course also members of Chavarat Shalom. And it, it was not easy. Mary will tell you more of yes. the challenges of having two kids. But um, the, the, our problem was that because we weren't close. Close physically. Close physically. I mean, we couldn't go to Friday night services and hang around and have a real Shabbos and then continue at Shabbos morning. If we would go Friday night, that would be very difficult with two young children, uh, so, which meant Shabbos morning, but then you come in Shabbos morning and the kids are tired and they want to go back. And, uh, and um, there were... Uh, there were aspects of the Chavarat Shalom approach that I liked, but I was not a davener. And so I, found, I actually found the religious expression too orthodox for my own personal taste mm -hmm. and well, predilection. What was your, uh, how would you explain the sort of notion of tefillah that was at the center of the I, Chavarat ideal? I think the the... Uh, Chavarat Shalom um, was really engaged in what Buber would have called entering the words of traditional prayer. And I liked that. And that had been part of what I had been about. Chavarat Shalom at that time was almost exclusively focused on that uh, entering the traditional liturgy. In the second year? This is 1969, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. My own increasing focus was on taking elements of personal spiritual significance, personal for me, for congregants, for others, and... Um, weaving them into the liturgy so that rather than probing purely the depths of Jewish spiritual expression, I wanted yichud, the unification of various elements of my religio-spiritual orientation. And um, I guess to that extent, and I'm not really focused on it or even reflected on it, but I think um, I was more inclined toward a kind of synthetic approach. I want to synthesize various elements. I mean, Thoreau, oh, look, I mean, um, there are so many sources that wasn't, we... Wasn't that what the Chavara was about, especially in that, those very early days. I've, Art Green described the, the, the sources uh, that the Chavara drew on as a patchwork creativity. And many people talk about the tension between innovation and mm. tradition. Mm -hmm. I, I, perhaps it was. What, I did not find that in the actual davening, in the actual services. They seem to me uh, far more traditional than uh, mm -hmm. I, I was inclined toward. Were you, uh, did you yourself try to bring other kinds of sources into the tefillah there? Um, like the I'm, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I, if I did, I'm not sure. If I did, they, they somehow didn't quite seem to fit. I, mean, I do not recall, and here my memory may be faulty, and it may even have been, <laughs> I mean, some of the dimness may be aggravated by whatever, you know, residual effects of the brain surgery. But I don't recall uh, that there was much, focus 
on other sources than the tradition and its deepening and its comprehension. Do, do you recall um, the incorporation of elements such as silences? Oh, yes. Yes, there was that. There were nigunim and there were silences, and those were salutary, definitely. And certainly, I mean, Hasidic and neo-Hasidic commentary, uh, abundant. And that was all very good. And look, service in the round, which I had always done, uh, which I had begun in Princeton. Um, and then um, seated on the floor and so on. I mean, all of that, very plus. And the homemade ark and uh, Richie Siegel's mother, I know, had designed a beautiful art curtain and so on. I mean, tremendous creativity yeah. and innovation. Oh, yes. Many people who were involved at the time talk about the intense spirituality of those, uh, of, of the services, of the davening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think by davening, they... They, it's an inclusive vision of all of this. Yes. Does that ring true for you? Did you find it spiritual in, in a sense? Oh, yeah. It, 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 yeah it, was, it was very much spiritual. As I say, it, it was not as encompassing of other sources of spirituality as my own eclectic vision, mm -hmm. but it was serious and spiritual in a way that one did not find in ordinary synagogue life. Mm. Yeah. Now, a, a, yeah, I, I should mention that, no, continue with your questions about the Chavarah. What were you going to say? No, I was going to talk about another Chavurah type group that we were became involved with the alternate religious community of Marblehead. That was a slightly later, right? Yeah, but while we were still at Packard Mans, mm -hmm. and while we were still involved with Chavurah Shalom, well, but it was well, slightly later. Yes. And was that a different experience? The with the ark, right? Oh yes, radically different. And what was radically different about it? Well, we were six families. So this was in Marblehead, is that correct? Yes, and we used to travel first from Stoughton to Marblehead, and then later when we lived in Andover and I served the congregation in Lowell, we used to commute from there. Mm -hmm. That was a 13-year involvement in Mar in, uh, with Marblehead, with the alternate religious community of Marblehead. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was six families, you were saying? Yeah. Uh, and... There it was very much child-oriented, but the adults were also interested. But there was certainly not the kind of Jewish learning, and there was not the spiritual intensity of Chavarat Shalom. There, the, I mean, Chavarat Shalom, you know, one was really engaged in communion with self and the divine. Um, it was a, a, a more mixed enterprise at uh, Ark in Marblehead. What was the role within Chavarat Shalom services of Torah study in the, in the context of services? Quite prominent, I would say, and um, was this challenging. A, yes, what? No, but was this no. something that was familiar to you, or was it innovative in your experience to be engaged in, in tour discussion during the service itself and learning? Uh, that was something that um, was familiar to me because it was something that I had begun to, to do with congregations uh, as early as my two years in Mexico City, I would often on a Friday evening focus on the Torah portion, cite a particular commentary, and invite responses. 
So that interchange and the active dialogue with scripture mm -hmm. was something I was familiar with and uh, appreciated very much. Can you recall uh, the kind of approaches that people took to that kind of Torah discussion and interpretation? For instance, for instance, mm -hmm. did, did uh, the discussion and the Torah and the discussion leader the, uh, at Chavrat Shalom focus much uh, on contemporary issues and relating the parsha to contemporary issues, or, or was it another dimension that was focused my, on? My recollection is that it would vary greatly with a particular individual. I mean, there were some who were kind of social activists. They would go at it from that perspective. Others were serious devotionalists. They would approach it in that fashion. Mm -hmm. That's my general uh, trace memory. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of any particularly memorable of our tours? Uh, sad. I, I don't, as I yeah. say, there's... Did you ever give any? Um, I don't remember mm -hmm. giving any. I, I, I think I taught some classes. Even that I don't remember so clearly. I, I did co-teach one with Joe Reamer. A Devar, a Devar Torah? No, the, oh, no, I, that class. Okay, we're gonna but I, do, I, I don't, I do not remember a mm -hmm. particular Devar Torah. I think I would. Uh, the the commitment to being there, all <clears throat> always felt ever so slightly doubtful. I mean, you know, who knew uh, how it would be with the kids or what the weather or the traffic would be like or how would we get there? Was I, was I dependable? And so I see, yeah. What's your sense, uh, looking back on um, what role women had in public worship during the years mm -hmm. that you were involved at Kavrat Shalom? Hmm. I, I seem to recall that um, Sharon Strassfeld uh, was a, a very effective leader of worship who touched my soul. I remember that also, especially of Barry Holtz. Um, what was it about how they I'm worship so, at Sibor that... I'm sorry, what? What, what about the, their way of doing this touched you? Sometimes just the inflection of the melody, the, uh, a, a sense of uh, maybe even a, a kind of softness of approach. Uh, I, 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 it may make no sense, but a, a humility before the text that enabled them to enter the word and make it alive. That's, uh, I, I don't know any other way to describe what happened. A, I, I, there were, I'm sure there were others who were very fine, but those are two that uh, I retain in memory. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of what it was like for Mary at these services? Uh, she, she will express it better than I, but I think for her they were terribly alien. That they didn't feel like my preferred method of prayer at that point, but I could 
engage. And um, the intensity was something I appreciated. <coughs> For her, I think that was not the case. And it wasn't just the question of women in the Chavura. Uh, though, at, at, you know, I'm still thinking about that. It seems to me most of the prominent voices were masculine. I, I was certainly aware of the women's movement because it was an internal issue in our own family structure at home. And Mary will tell you vivid tales of um, the uh, inauguration and training of uh, this um, previously non-egalitarian father. And you. Yes. <laughs> but um, at Chavarat Shalom, it, it seemed to me that men and women shared most of the tasks. And um, I'm trying to remember if there were other people, other women who uh, led services. I, I have a dim memory that uh, Women uh, were uh, especially prominent on occasion at, at the uh, Megillat Esther, the Purim celebration. And, uh, but uh, I, I don't have a... Some people have mentioned Janet Wolf. Yes. That's interesting. Yes, uh, she was on the periphery and... Uh, I think she she represented a, a quieter kind of spirituality, but uh, she was an influence, yes, mm -hmm. um, in, in a very soft-spoken way. I mean, uh, Sharon's was more uh, audible mm -hmm. and um, a bit more verbal. But Janet, Janet did bring um, a soft spirituality. I, I, yeah. Do you think that as you try and remember back to this time? Yes. Were the members, the male members, the, who were the majority by far still at this point? Yeah. Were they concerned about or interested in sort of the issues that the sort of just burgeoning, growing, inchoate Jewish feminism, Jewish feminism was starting to surface? I, um, I would say yes, within the, um, the, the limitations of our own vision at that time. We had a lot of learning to do. And uh, as I look back, I think we were more benighted than I can possibly imagine at this point. I, I think um, we, most of us were profoundly unaware of the depths of transformation that were would be would be necessary to give women a, a full equal voice and i think the most difficult aspect was as i reflect that to make way for other voices meant reducing both the frequency and the volume of our own. And that's where, how do you call it? Aye, there's the rub. I, I think finally um, that kind of egalitarian sharing um, entails the qu uh, what all sharing entails, namely uh, a moderation and restraint of 
frequency and volume of one's own voice. Women often <laughs> were learning this in the context of so-called consciousness raising groups. Mm -hmm. Explicitly feminist mm -hmm. consciousness raising. Yeah. Were men, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like men were learning this within Chavarat Shalom, often in the context of their own personal relationships, as much if not more than in the communal uh, context at that time. I think that's accurate. And I think, uh, I mean, certainly uh, my learning uh, was primarily personal and familial, intrafamilial. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, I, 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 I was not inclined to the consciousness grazing groups and, uh, or men's consciousness. I, I know a, a number of friends have been participants for decades in men's groups. I've not been drawn to that. Many people have talked about the Chavara as a context in which male bonding and male friendship uh, was really nurtured and given mm -hmm. a space to develop in a way that for many people <clears throat> it had not been, not existed previously in their lives. Was uh -huh. that, does that ring right to you? Was that the case for you in any sense? <clears throat> I, I would, I don't feel that that was the case for me personally. Somehow I was, I, I could see that ha occurring, and there were people for whom that was the case. <clears throat> for whatever reason, whether just a, a certain personal shyness in terms of groups, uh, uh, or our um, distance from uh, Chavarat Shalom. Uh, I, I felt close to a number of people. We're still close. And I mean, some of our dearest friends are from that period. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the Paley's and uh, Strasfeld and uh, and the Holtz, I mean, the, I mean, these are people uh, dear to us, as our, among our closest friends, however rarely we see them. But um, I think uh, maybe it was Chavarat Shalom that provided the context for that bonding, but I, I don't, I don't feel that my own pattern of relating to people and uh, mm -hmm. developing close friendships was much affected by the general, the, the special circumstance of Chavarat Shalom. Were you able, living at Packard Mance and not <laughs> in close proximity as most people were, were you able to participate in the weekly uh, communal meetings that took place and meals, or was that something that... Rare, <coughs> rarely, yeah. so that the the essence. <clears throat> well, no, not the essence, but the necessary accompaniment of community, namely all the details of the housekeeping, the budgeting, the this, the that, the reconciliation. How come so much noise through that wall, etc. and Hey, how come your second-hand smoke is in my face and not out the window? <laughs> I mean, you know, the, these are real issues of community and living together. No, those uh, I missed. So you, you also missed, it sounds like, a great deal of the uh, quote-unquote group processing, which was such a prominent feature for many people, and both a positive and extremely challenging feature for many people. Oh, indeed. Now, we, 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 we had our dose of it at Packard Mance. Ah. <laughs> Remember, I mean, I was technically staff, and Mary <clears throat> was, uh, 
was de facto staff until the question of recognition came up. That she will relate yep. with relish. <laughs> uh, no, so I all of that shock levitaria, as we would say, all of that kind of. I, I'm I'm tempted to say processing, terminal and uh, terminable and interminable. What was that phrase you just used? Uh, I I think Freud had had a, a, a classic phrase like uh, analysis terminable and interminable. Um, will this processing never end? Um, I'm 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 less sim I'm less sympathetic to it, less given to it, less. Uh, a willing participant in it than I probably should have been, and we're able or should to sidestep be. it for a variety of reasons. Yeah, in this context. Yeah, that yeah. Didn't affect I mean, much you know. Many. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so <laughs> um, I, I want to uh, move to the question of study and learning, which ah. is a prominent place for you. Yes, to yes. A, a key role. Um, yes. What would you say was the Chavara's vision for the role of teaching and learning within the community? Mm. Um, well, first of all, I think, I, I think that what I recall as Reb Zalman's classic phrase, um, one of our tasks is to break the safer barrier. In what other words, mean? which meant enough literacy so that you can really grapple with primary texts. And that, you know, that's a pretty high goal. But I, I would say that was one very important um, focus. My other, uh, another sense of, of the learning was that um, the texts and <clears throat> engaged with be seen in terms of our time and our issues. That is the the eternal relevance or relevance renewed of texts and of thought and of outlooks really um, came into play. I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I mean, I did do some teaching there. When you, when you were first I, involved, the, the, yeah. the Havara was still sort of seen as a, and was functioning as a seminary, an alternative seminary. Yeah. That fell by the wayside with probably within a year or so of when you began. When you first started, were there, do you have a sense of any particular uh, curriculum or a set of skills that the faculty was intent on making sure that people uh, mm. were on top of? Mm -hmm. um, I think I think probably <clears throat> Art Zalman and I had some some ideas. And were the three of you the ones that were thinking a lot about these kinds of issues? I, I was certainly interested in uh, that seminary aspect, and uh, my my vision of actually training people to uh, enhance Jewish communal life. Training people as rabbis? Yeah, or as, as, if not rabbis, as mentors or leaders of groups. Uh, at that time, I, I had written an article, um, yes, uh, Is There a Choice? Uh, and I, I made out a case for uh, a, a living room synagogue groups as alternatives to 
formal buildings and structures and all of that. Um, I have more mixed feelings about it now. I like, I like Jewish institutions. I like Jewish visibility. Jewish spaces. In that yeah, sense. yeah. I think. I think. I mean, uh, uh, is time um, beyond space? Sure. And I, uh, to that extent, I'm a Heschel loyalist. But I, I do appreciate space. And uh, hey, I'm glad the Pritzkers fund the Zohar, but I'm also glad they fund the, that architectural award. So, <laughs> um, yeah. ma many people, many people have pointed to you as an important teacher for them in these in the years that you were involved. Um, can you uh, recall what some of the courses you taught were? What what did you want to teach about you yourself? Yeah, it's, it's so, that is so interesting. I did some teaching, and I know one of the things I was really passionate about and felt urgency about was nature elements in Judaism. She said uh, the, the relationship between soil and spirit. Yeah, that's, that's good. Whoa. That's your phrase. <laughs> okay, it it says it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I would say that was very much my my focus, my intended focus. In exactly what courses I I can't remember, and I don't know that I have any file of curricula. Which is odd, but I, I, that's a kind of lapse. Maybe it was right here and when he drilled these holes, um, a, a little piece of it. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, but yes, I, I, you know, that, I think that, but, but also, oh my God, look, at, in those years, the, my three foci were really, uh, at peace, the anti-war issue, racial justice, right. and uh, n the preservation of nature. Um, issues of, egal of, of, let's say, economic imbalance, a little less so. I, I was aware of them. Uh, they've been a continuing concern, mm -hmm. but uh, but those other three were really uh, the emphasis. And I, yeah. Do you recall um, sitting in classes at all? Were you a, were you a learner as well as a? I think teacher? so. I think I tried to go to maybe something of arts or something of Zalman's. Yeah. Um, sure, because they. I mean. They were both funds of already treasuries of knowledge, and uh, and many many people have talked about the uh, communal ideal of everyone as both a teacher and a learner, and mm -hmm. how that fit in with the egalitarian oh. and non hierarchical ethos yes. of the of the of the Chavara as a community. That's that was very much the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, in it, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I mean, in any class, uh, responses from the students were highly valued and genuinely listened to. From what, as I say, my memories are so vague. I remember co-teaching a course with Joe Reamer. I also have the impression that he did most of the cohesive <laughs> organizing of it. What My, was the class about? Uh, I think it was something about uh, Jews and Jesus, possibly, mm -hmm. because I, my, uh, I'd had some some courses at when I was in history and philosophy of religions. I I had two or three courses with. Christer Stendhal, who yes. was of some note mm -hmm. in those years, and uh, that that felt like a, a live issue, both because we 
were involved in an ecumenical center, but also because the question of interreligious relations was very prominent mm -hmm. in terms of Chavarat Shalom. How so? It, it seems to me that um, once you take seriously the, the realm of the spiritual, you are both anchored in and yet launched from a particular tradition into a common sphere. And spatially speaking, you could say either um, I in, into the common horizon or into the common depth. But um, what, your perforation and this perforation and the other, and, and maybe, maybe we hit the same artesian vein of water. So I think inherent in the, the Chavura quest for spiritual discovery and religious intensity and authenticity, you necessarily must confront and deal with comparable findings from other probings. Yet, at least my impression is that your experience, going back to your childhood and certainly your adolescence and involvement with the American Friends Service Committee and your postings in various other communities, your involvement in Packard Mance, had given you a much broader exposure to other uh, religious I, I guess that than, many, I, than many had had. I think that's true. Uh, so some of this may be, you know, my, uh, my personal projection. But it was also a time when people were very interested, increasingly interested in the philosophies of Eastern religions, etc. It was oh. in the environment, in the air. So I imagine this might I mean, be I very welcome. Yeah, perspective. I, 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 <clears throat> I, I can remember one of my teachers at Columbia, Jakob Taubus, um, saying, Gendler, I mean, you're a Zen, a Zen it's Zen Judaism. Um, <laughs> We didn't have Jubu's quite yet. Not yet. Not yet. Zen Judaism. But you know, those were the days of D.T. Suzuki and, you know, all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And Alan, what was his name? The, the West Coaster. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So one more topic before we... Break. Of course. And that is uh, social activism. Ah. And uh, its relationship to the Chavarad. Oh, oh, oh let, let me add one other thing about the the nat nature elements in Judaism. One of one of the uh, one of the things we tried to do was uh, have people from Chavarat Shalom. Once we had moved to Andover, and uh, I was involved, we we were involved with Ark in Marblehead, but I was now serving half time this small liberal temple in Lowell. So this is uh, like seventy one. Yeah, so, yeah, 71, 70. We would encourage people to come up and uh, help us uh, with our gardening project mm -hmm. uh, so that they would a experience, you know, contact with uh, living plants and so on. First hand. Yeah. And uh, Ma Mary, I'll leave to Mary the description of the general experience. I must say Michael Paley was a superb worker. But Michael had spent one summer as a teenager um, doing agricultural work, I think, in Norway and doing haying. So he was a real, he was a seasoned field hand. Many of the others were very remote from soil. <laughs> Indeed. 
<laughs> yeah, but but you you were you were then you were starting to so ask. We're starting to talk about uh, social action. Yes, so yes. Clearly, as we've been saying, <clears throat> um, civil rights, the yeah, yeah. anti-war movement, other right. aspects of social activism. Yeah, uh, were a central part of life for, for people. Um, how did I? I wanted to ask you how you found the political atmosphere at Havrat Shalom and how compatible you found it to your own uh, mm. both values and also level of engagement and desire to be engaged. Yeah, I'd say again it varied greatly with the individuals. There was a, there were some who were pretty identified as social activists, and. Uh, I've, I, I felt an affinity with them. I mean, look, I mean, I, we, I'd been active and was active still in the social, in a racial justice issue and the issue of peace and conscription and so on. And, um, and many of, of, of the young men at Chavarat Shalom uh, had problems of conscience with the American involvement in Vietnam. Not to mention the draft in the early days. That's right, that's right. So um, in all of that, uh, I was engaged. I should add that also at that period during uh, Packard Mance, when abortion was illegal in Massachusetts, um, I was involved in some counseling and referrals of um, young women to uh, alternatives in Canada. Hmm. Um, and also because of the time I had spent in, <clears throat> in Mexico, I had uh, a couple of medical contacts there to which I refer referred uh, a few people, sort of privately, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with total confidentiality, and uh, there were anyway. So I, with all with all of those, I I, I felt close, and and there was that impulse. Yeah, among some in Chavarat Shalom. Others, I think, were uh, more, were quieter on that front. Was it more a question of people's personal and individual inclinations, or did the Chavara as a whole have uh, sort of <laughs> a stance on, on where uh, <clears throat> social engagement <throat> and activism should be in the life of the community? I think the Chavura was consensual enough so that uh, individual option mm -hmm. was... My sense is that individual inclination determined the degree of involvement. There was not an overall ethos. Uh, but I, uh, having missed you know, so many of the processing meetings, mm -hmm. I'm probably unaware did of. You ever, did you and Mary ever attend uh, retreats at Weiss's farm? Oh, yes. We were at a, at least a couple of them. Yeah. Lo I loved them. <laughs> what did you love about them? Ah, uh, I mean, the, the energy, the, um, the, the liveliness, of worship, the melodies. Um, my sense of Chavarat Shalom, of, of the service, there were nigunim and there was davening. Uh, personally, I, I, I really love the nefty musical expression. Nefty you know, as in the... Nefty, Northeast, Fe the National Federation of Temple Youth. Nifty. I would say, yeah, nifty. Yeah. Nifty was New England. Yeah, yeah Nifty. Uh, I get, Nifty is more my musical home than either traditional nigunim mm. or davening. It's interesting. It is. It's interesting. 
And I, I, I mean, some of the compositions of not just Debbie Friedman, but say Michael Isaacson mm -hmm. from Reform Liturgy. Wow, that, speak to that, you. that yeah. speaks to me beyond um, some of the yeah. neo-Hasidic expression and uh, also a, of, of the, you know, the, what do you call it, the renewal community. I, uh, boy, I, I'm, not, I'm not drawn to their melodies, if so we may designate them. Yeah. Last topic before we stop mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for the moment, and that is uh, Zionism, which we've touched on. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the period after the Six Day War, uh, just prior to the Yom Kippur War, and you had your had particular views um, on on Zionism and and the the place of Israel. How did that sort of can, can you articulate them a little briefly and, and say how that sort of sat within the general context of the Havara and, and people's notions and feelings, personal mm -hmm. feelings? <clears throat> um, my general impression, and this could be just my private filter operating, my general impression is that Havara Shalom was, um, for the most part, uh, not focused on Zionism or Israel. And that was one of the things I most appreciated about it. People have described it as a, quote, distinctly American phenomenon. That is exactly what I loved and affirmed about it. And uh, my basic attitude then was, uh, we used to talk about um, the questionability of vicarious atonement, which we used to say was a Christian doctrine. Nobody's going to atone for your sins except you, buddy, so the blood of the Lamb, spare me that. I think that Chavirat Shalom was a blessed antidote to the danger a vicarious Jewish living through the great totem called Israel. And uh, it was American. It is American. This is where we are. This is where we live. Uh, the spiritual infusion from what emerged from that sacred soil is ours to receive and root in the soil where we find ourselves. Uh, I mean, I, I would argue that uh, the sanctity of soil is potentially universal, depending on the intention which is brought to a particular piece of land. And um, the universality of sacred soil is uh, a profound resource in reducing irres irresolvable conflicts over particular pieces of land. And that, that certainly is, is something that I felt Chavarat, I don't think Chavarat Shalom was as neutral toward Israel and Zionism as I have been. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done a passport inspection uh, to discover. But were you aware of, uh, were there tensions around Israel, its place, what you should be doing? I I, I, I don't think I sensed much of that mm -hmm. in the Chavura. Mm -hmm. Maybe there were others who did. Maybe there were some who were more Israel-focused. But uh, my sense of Chavura Shalom was that it was the great enabler of full participation in 
Jewish religious spiritual life here where we are. Yeah. I think that's a great place for us to end for now. My name is Jane Guberman. Today is Thursday, October 20th, 2016. I'm here with Mary Gendler at her home in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Mary, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, particularly as they intersect with Chavarot Shalom. And I'd like to start by talking a little bit about your personal and family background, so we'll have a sense of who you are at the time you got involved with Chavarot. Okay. Let's begin with your family when you were growing up. You were born in 1940 mm -hmm. in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Would you say Missouri? <laughs> no, we didn't say Missouri, but we could. We knew how. <laughs> can, can you tell me a bit about your family when you were, when you were growing up? Uh, yes, I grew up in uh, an upper middle class Jewish family. We, uh, we lived in a very nice house, and uh, they sent us to private school. Tell me about your father and your mother before. Oh, okay. My father was, um, he had his own paper business. And uh, my mother was a housewife. Uh, she was very outgoing and lots of fun, and everybody loved her, but she had an underside where she was depressed and would uh, drink too much and take de anti-depression pills and things. So it was, it was very mixed for, for her. Uh, and my father traveled a lot when I was young, and so he's on, on the road with his with his business, but we were always very well cared for, very well dressed, very well fed, very well educated. How, it was just a little nutsy in my house. What? How about your siblings? Did you have siblings? I had an older sister, two and a half years older, and a younger brother, six, six years younger. Yeah. And so I was the middle. You were in the middle. Um, so you were telling me about uh, your community. What, what was Kansas City like? Um, at that time, well, and what kind of a Jewish community? Do okay, you have? I mean, Kansas City is. If you're in the main parts of the earth, it's a beautiful, beautiful city, and um, a, a wealthy city, unless you're black or living in those other parts of the city. So the the world that I inhabited was very beautiful, huge mansions, beautifully decorated, Country Club Plaza. So I lived in a very, very lovely world. Um, my own family, in terms of the Jewish community, uh, most Easterners say they're Jews in the Midwest. Are there really Jews in the Midwest? And I said, you would be surprised. So there, was, uh, there were some Orthodox, but there was a very large conservative temple, synagogue, and then our, our temple, which was like 2,000 families or something. It was very, very, very big. And uh, very reform, very classically reform. What did that mean? What did that mean? That means uh, coming out of that classical tradition, we don't want to be that different from our neighbors. We don't want to look and sound that different. Uh, but we still want to be Jewish. And uh, so the customs, I mean, by, I went to Sunday school. I got confirmed and all of that. But we always had a Christmas tree and we dyed Easter eggs. And I once asked my father, why do we have a Christmas tree? And he said, it's pretty, it smells good. I thought, oh, okay. And we used to light the Hanukkah candles next to the Christmas tree. Um, so my part of that world was very, very classical reform. No Hebrew was taught in the Sunday school, no bar and bat mitzvahs. Uh, confirmation was the big thing. And a lot of the emphasis, uh, it, it like came out of the social justice um, and uh, that kind of approach that the prophetic good tradition. the prophetic tradition yes that's what I was trying to say yeah, yeah. and uh, it it really that was very powerful for me and we had a rabbi Rabbi Samuel Merberg who was like Moses he he was tall he had gray hair sort of pushed back and he would be in his black robe. And he would give these sermons, and it was, you know, you thought, like, wow, 
but it was very, very powerful uh, for me as a child. And was your family involved in the life of the synagogue? Well, yes. My uh, my grandfather helped found it, and my father was president during the time that they were building the new building. So there was lots and lots of of uh, involvement in in that sense, and uh, my. More traditional Eastern Jewish friends just can't understand why I feel Jewish and why I am Jewish because the rituals were not a part of my growing up. Such as what? What kind of rituals were not? Uh, well, I mean, for one thing, and we'll get to it later, all the davening and all of that. It's like, never heard it, never heard of it. But, um, and we didn't, we never learned Hebrew. We did not read from the Torah. Um, you didn't read from the Torah during services? Whatever was in the book. I don't remember them taking out the Torah. Well, they must have, but I don't remember. I was always counting the lights on the ceiling to see, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how many were burned out and how many were still going. Uh, but, no, but uh, for me, I, I, just, I became very, I think I was really influenced by the prophetic tradition ways and how, what that, uh, what I was learning through Judaism, and that's what Judaism came to mean to me. Um, for example, I never knew you should celebrate eight days of Passover. You have a Seder, you eat matzah, and Passover's over. I mean... Things like that. I didn't know that there were two days of all these holidays. You know, Rosh Hashanah, two days. I mean, it's like my father would say, why do they read in both Hebrew and English? Because God heard you the first time. <laughs> and uh, so it, uh, it was all that sort of ritual trappings of Judaism that just, uh, they just weren't in my world. They weren't in my consciousness. And whenever I got married, in many ways, we called it mixed marriage because he'd gone to Jewish Theological Seminary. And I just didn't, I didn't know all this stuff. Where had your families um, come, in? come from? Where did your families come from? Um, well, I know on my mother's side, they, uh, my grandmother was born in Itasca, Texas. And I think some of it on my, um, my father's side I think there was some in Baltimore, and his side of the family came through from Alsace Lorraine, uh, the um, France. yeah, the France. Uh, and he always said it was the town of Trier. I don't, I don't know it, but so yeah, that's where they came from. Your family belonged to a Jewish country club, is that right? Of course, Oakwood Country Club. What was it called? O Oakwood. Oakwood Country Club. Why a Jewish country club? Why? All their friends were Jewish, too. I mean, it, it really is, as I said, for example, Sharon just cannot get that I feel very Jewish because I don't know all of these other things. Me, Sharon Strassel. Sharon Strassel. Yeah. My, my uh, parents' friends were all Jewish. I mean, they had, they had to do with the other uh, with everyone else in the community, but really their circle of friends was Jewish. Mine less so because I went to a private school where there was an unnamed quota of two Jews per class. Um, so I knew lots and lots, lots of my friends were Christian. But um, they, were, they were really involved Jewishly in, in their own way. Did you encounter any anti-Semitism when you were a child at all? There was one incident, I'm smiling, because there were a couple, of, there was at least one country club which would not allow Jews to come to the country club. And there was also a, um, uh, well, anyway, so um, at one point, one of the girls in our class uh, was having a birthday party, and she was having it at that country club. And I said, I can't come because I'm Jewish, I can't go in. And so uh, a number of the other classmates said, then we won't go either. So it, 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 was, it was instructive. It was, not a, it was not a really heavy, you know, experience. It was actually kind of, kind of affirming because they weren't going to do that. So um, that, was, that was the 
probably the main thing. There was there was a whole section in Kansas City, a new area growing, uh, building up, that was Juden free. I mean, Jews could not buy there. This was in the fifties. So it's it's really astonishing when I think back at, uh, on that. But it didn't it didn't really you know hurt me in any way. But except that it was just like indignant in some ways. It's like what what are you doing? Um, you you said you went to Jewish summer camps and that they were yes. an important component of your experience. What, what camp did you go to? What kind of an impact? Did I that went on to you? Camp Chikagami. In northern Wisconsin. Say it again. Camp Chickagami. Chickadami. Chickagami. Gami. Okay. Uh, and it was run, and I think it had been started by the wife of the Reformed Jewish rabbi in St. Louis. Um, uh, his name, uh, Isserman. He was Ferd Isserman, and she was known as Mrs. I. And it was just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful camp. Most of the kids were from St. Louis, which is where my mother was from and where that uh, rabbi lives. So, the, so the, uh, there, were, there were a lot of kids from uh, St. Louis, but then some from other parts also. And I just loved being outside. I loved canoeing. I loved trekking in the forest. It, it, just, was, it just was me, you know, there. And, and that was f fabulous. We used to have Friday night services and we would all dress up in white. Most of the counselors were not Jewish, but we would sit around the fire and we'd have Friday night services and do some singing. And it was really lovely. What kind of songs would you sing? Oh, camp songs. Mm -hmm. Jewish uh, songs or not? No, not so much Jewish songs. Mm -hmm. Camp, campy songs. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there was a real service. I mean, I, as I can remember, it wasn't, but a reform service. Was there challah and candle lighting, that kind of sure there was ritual? I'm sure there was candle lighting. I can't remember the challah, but... Was there candle lighting in your home? Um, not very often, I mean, for ritual purposes. No. I mean, we would have candles, but that wasn't necessarily... That was just for... Because they looked pretty. Was the Jewish environment of this camp appealing to you? Did it have well, an impact on... Your sense of Jewishness and your, your Jewish identity? Well, what's interesting is that the only sort of ritual part of it was the, um, was the Friday night services. But there was an awareness that all of the campers were Jewish. And um, maybe some comfort in that, but I'd, I was comfortable in, in other kinds of groups of kids too. So I don't know how much it influenced except that I guess there was a certain connection of the camp experience, which I adored, and the fact that it was a Jewish place where I was experiencing this. And so they got, they got merged together in, in many ways for me. And as you can see here, I, my, my life and soul is outside, outside uh, camping, gardening, whatever. Did you have exposure to that as a young child that sparked that interest, or where do you see that as I, originating? In I don't life? really know. We had, we had a nice yard, and my mother used to grow flowers some, but I don't remember you know, even joining in with her that much. I remember I used to climb trees and read books in them. Um, and, and beyond that, I, I don't know. It just seems to have been in there. As you said, in, you, you went to a private girls' school right? from 1st to 12th grade, yes, all the way through. Um, and then you went to college at Stanford, and mm -hmm. this was the late 50s, early 60s? Yes, I was there 58 to 62. How did you decide on Stanford? Because I didn't get into Radcliffe. That's how I decided. <laughs> and I didn't like it. I, I needed a place like Radcliffe. Stanford was not academically serious enough for me. And it had all these fraternities and all of this stuff. The only way I actually got through it was going to the International Center where I met some people mm. who were very interesting. What, what were you interested in studying at that point? I was an English major. Mm -hmm. You know, women 
learn English majors, and then they go and teach school. What else would women be doing? Was that your vision for sort of, where you yeah. were headed? Sort of. In life? Yeah. The following decade uh, was certainly a momentous one, both in your personal life and in mm -hmm. the general society. Um, can you tell us what um, were for you the most important and formative developments during that period? In, in, start with your personal life. Obviously, you met Everett in the middle. Well, let, let me go back a little further because mm -hmm. uh, when I was at Stanford, I discovered there was a place called Berkeley, which nobody had told me about at Sunset Hill School for Girls. They did not say, here's a place you might find interesting. And so I was really unhappy that I hadn't known of it because Berkeley was boiling and it was yeah. wonderful and that's where it was all happening. So um, I, I would go there from time to time, but it wasn't, you know, right, right next door. Um, but that was sort of the beginning of these social movements and yes. of anti-war movements and nuclear power and all of this. And um, I was very drawn to all of that. Now, I spent my junior year in France, and I spent a year in France after my graduation. So um, those were very interesting years. Um, I wasn't particularly politically involved at that time, but... I can remember driving in a taxi cab in Paris when it was one of these riots about Algeria and thinking, let's just keep going this way, you know, you don't want to get too close. Huh. So, so I, was, I was aware of all of that and I, um, oh, I know the other thing that's important, which is my, my parents and all of their friends were very conservative. If I tell you, politically, if I tell you that my father voted for Goldwater, you will get an idea. I don't know where it came for me, but early on, certainly in my adolescence, I was very, very um, drawn to sort of political things and thinking very differently about it. And the way I got through it, there was one Quaker family in Kansas City whose, whose kids I was friends with. And they were, that was like, where I could go to be home politically about that. Everybody was, everybody else, nobody would get it. I mean, they, uh, I cheered when um, uh, McCarthy uh, died. Nobody else did. So it was a very, very conservative thing. And so they, they introduced me to something called I.F. Stone's Weekly, which was the radical newspaper. And, you know, they were just like home for me. And so when I went to Stanford, everybody had first-year class in Western civilization. And I got called a socialist in a commie by the kids in my class because you know, I was so radical. How did those labels feel to you? They feel fine to me. <laughs> did they then at the time? I didn't mind. I didn't mind. I thought, you know, they're, they're kind of jerky. They don't really know what they're talking about. No, it was not anything that, that I disliked. I, uh, no, it was just being dumb. <laughs> so you spent... A year Actually, I was proud of it, if I'm being really honest. I was kind of pleased. So, so you spent the, a year in France. The six, second year, 62-63. 63 and After I graduated from And Stanford. where were you headed when you came back, did you think? Well... I thought I was headed to Columbia Graduate School, which I had been admitted to in, what? Uh, in comparative literature. And my father wrote to me and said, you have to come home. You have to come home and take care of your mother. She's not well. She really had a lot of problems with depression and whatever. And you have to come home. And it was like, well, but, but, but I was going to go to Columbia and then I was going to work my way around the world. That was my plan. Instead, as I say famously, I ended up a rabbi's wife in New Jersey, but never mind. Uh, so I spent, I spent that uh, year, I, had, I was not rebellious enough to refuse that. And so I commuted to Kansas University and I got a master's in English just because I was doing something. And that was the year that I met Everett. How did you meet him? Well, pretty funny story. So all my friends had moved away in Kansas City. All my group of sort of radical, crazy drinking friends were gone. 
and I'm in Kansas City, I don't know anybody. So um, I started going out with the assistant rabbi at our temple. And I mean, it was practically the first Jew I'd ever dated. I mean, it was really amazing. But um, so he at one point gave me a call and he said he'd gotten a phone call from a woman that I, they both knew her in New York, that Evergannon was coming through, he'd been involved with King, and he was coming through Kansas City to talk about his experiences. And would I like to go? And I said, sure, you know, nothing like this ever happened in Kansas City before, this is pretty good. So I, um, so we went, and because they had this common girlfriend in New York, we went out with Everett and his brother-in-law, and we had tea afterwards. So we started talking, jabber, 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 who was across the uh, table from me. And so at the very end, we exchange addresses, and I go home. Hmm. Not too long after that, I get a letter from him saying, uh, you know, how are you? Nice to meet you, and I don't remember what else, but we started corresponding, and then he invited me to come visit him uh, in Princeton over the winter vacation. And I had been planning to go skiing in Colorado, which I've never been able to do since. But so I, have, I debated, am I going to go skiing or am I going to go? Finally, I said, what the hell? Let's just see what's going on. So uh, I lied to my parents. Only I thought I was lying, but I didn't because I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to New York and look for work. <laughs> and um, I came home 10 days later and I said, I'm getting married. And they said, to who? Because, I mean, I really wasn't dating anybody. I mean, nothing. And so because my father was so stuffy about his reform stuff, I said, Dad, and it was his fault. He brought me back, back to Kansas City. I said, Dad, you are going to love him. His side curls are down to here, and his beard's down to here, and his great hat up here. My father's, like, turning purple and blue and whatever. So, <laughs> but... We saw each other two or three times and visited each other. And the end of May, we got married and started getting to know each other. It was pretty crazy, pretty impulsive. So, <laughs> it was. But, uh, so you moved to New Jersey. Uh, yes, I moved to Princeton, New Jersey. I mean, I say, well, I became a rabbi's wife, rabbi's wife in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And Everett always says, Princeton, New Jersey, mm -hmm. which is true. That's a little different than just New Jersey. Were you involved in the civil rights movement uh, and, uh, and the anti-war movement oh, yourself? Yes, all of that. Uh, I mean, one of the, there were many, many things that attracted me uh, about Everett. Uh, but that key core one at the beginning was his involvement with civil rights. And um, as I said, for myself growing up, so much of my Jewish identity uh, is tied up in, in the prophetic tradition and in doing social justice. So I thought, you know, that was really exciting. After we got married, we did go down to Selma together. Um, and that was very exciting, very scary, very interesting. And, um, you know, it was just amazing. We were in the first Selma, not the second. We were not when they went over the bridge and got all beaten up. We actually went down and we turned around. Uh, so, but there was still, you know, views of these dogs straining on their leashes, and there was a uh, Unitarian minister who got clubbed to death down there. So this was not, you know, playtime. Yeah. yeah. So yes, I was in, uh, involved in that, and then on and on. I mean, everything, everything there was, a Vietnam and anti-nuclear power and women's rights, and oh, two or three others. Mm -hmm. I often went to D.C. to march, and, you know, things like that. It was, a, it was a very exciting time. I mean, that didn't mean that everything that was going on was great, but it was exciting. There was a sense of movement and turmoil, that things were really roiling around, and some things were, were changing, and changing for the better. Were you aware of the publication of the, uh, the Feminine Mystique uh, Betty, and Betty Friedan's? Yeah, I mean, I, I was very early on. I um, 
uh, actually, we came back from Mexico, and this is what was in the air. Feminism, feminism, feminism. When are you talking about? 1970, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 71. And so I was aware of all that writing. In addition, what this is how important it was for me. Um, I had, let me see how to explain this. I'd been a very active, outgoing uh, uh, young woman and very, whatever, self-sufficient self or whatever. And I got married, and I've heard this is true for others. I felt like I fell into a black hole, and I disappeared. All of a sudden, I was wife, I was mother, but none of that was what I had ever thought of as me. And um, it, it, that, it was really anguishing pro process. It was very, very difficult. Because at that time, you know, if you're married, you take care of the kids, you, uh, you know, you take care of your husband, and it was just all there. But I had been a very independent young woman, and none of that had ever been in my world. And all of a sudden, this became my world. Did being a rabbi's wife even exacerbate that feeling or the expectations of you, do you think? Well, one of the things we discussed very thoroughly before we got married was his work, not mine. And he was going to protect me from all of that. And I do remember, uh, I was like 23 years old, I was really young, and I'd been there for a little while. and. In my mind, this woman who was like six feet tall with her breast out to here, you know, and dragon lady, said, not, not fair, not true what she was. But she asked if um, I would give the opening prayer at the Hadassah meeting. First of all, I'd never even heard of Hadassah before that. But anyway, so I said, no, no, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable. That's my husband's department. It's not mine. And she said, oh, we assumed he would write it. And I said, thank you very much, no. And they left me alone after that. I mean, I really, but it was, it was also hard there because that was a congregation that uh, rabbis up here on the pedestal. And uh, we would come in to a social occasion and whatever they were talking about, it would turn to religion. And like I kept telling to say, you know, he could talk about other things besides religion. You don't have to do that. So, um, so whether it was uh, grew out of, I don't think it was so much about being a Robinson. It was all of a sudden about being a wife and a mother, mm. and all all of those things that I had never expected or prepared for, and yet felt pressure because of the society that that's what I should be doing and that's what I should want to be doing. And as a result, I felt guilty about my deeds. And even more, I had this husband who was very involved politically and everybody worships him and thinks he's so wonderful. And who am I to say, you've got to stay home tonight and not do anything besides take care of your children. You know, uh, and then I'd say, oh my God, but he's changing the world and he's this. And then I would feel so selfish. And it was a very, very painful, painful time. Um, and of course, he'd grown up typical Jewish male. And it was like, yeah, yeah, that's what you do. Whatever it alluded to in his talk was when we were living in Stoughton and the, um, I finally had sort of, screwed up my courage to say, I want one night a week and I'm going to go into Boston and I'm going to do something I want to do. I think I took like jewelry making. I don't know what it was. Anyway, so the first time I went, he was a grown man. Our children were like one and a half and three and a half or four. I fixed the dinner and I got a babysitter to put the kids to bed. It was like, that was how much I feel like, felt like he was just not capable of doing none of it. I think of that now and I go, oh my God. He's embarrassed too when he thinks about that. So we had a lot of reworking to do within, within our marriage uh, about all of that. And I hadn't really realized how angry I was. I knew I was miserable, but I didn't realize I was angry. And then as the women's movement came along and there were, there were uh, 
you know, groups that you would discuss things with. Did and you participate in consciousness? Yes, consciousness lot, groups? lots, lots. And they were very important. And, um, you know, I had a lot of anger um, that I don't think was just sort of baseless anger. I mean, it was anger about this whole setup about how women were supposed to be and what was expected of them and what they were supposed to do. And I just thought, this is really unfair. The way, one of the ways that I worked my way through this, aside from Everett and I managing to stay together, I started writing about uh, Jewish women and historical things. When I actually, was that, though? This was like 1970. My first uh, article was in response, and they never, they didn't, they didn't put the title on it, but it was called um, uh, Like All the Women. And it, it was um, about, you know, a Jewish woman, and, but, you know, we've been so fixed in, in this way, and, and uh, there's other things that need to be seen about us. And then I started writing about biblical women. I wrote about Lilith. I was the first one to write about Lilith. I wrote about Vashti. Um, uh, I wrote a couple of other things, but the one thing that um, <laughs> people do remember if they've read it, it was, a, it was called Sarah's Seed. And it was a ritual that I was proposing that uh, grew out of the fact that the circumcision is the, is the sign of the covenant in men's bodies. So that automatically excludes women from being a part of the covenant. Now, wait a minute. So what I proposed was a ritual rupturing of the hymen, not the clitoris, just that little membrane, which they could tell whether you were, had ever been had sex before or not. I mean, it was a liberating thing. And far less, would have been far less painful than, than the circumcision. Well. At, at what age were you proposing doing this? Uh, eight days. Eight days. Yeah, as a comparable uh, time for the uh, for the girls, yeah. and you know all you had to do was one little prick. You didn't have to cut something off. So I just became the Lilith of my generation, and I can I can remember. I think it was Levy Kelman had gone to some uh, re, you know lefty Jewish group thing, and what was being said was, "Hide you buried baby daughters. Here comes Mary Gindler." Like, you know, I had suddenly become the, you know, the Lilith of, and I was going to grab the babies and, and the thing that is amazing to me is that was seen as such a radical, such an intrusive kind of thing. But what about circumcision? So I gained some notoriety in the community. I also was doing, asked to do a lot of speaking so uh, it was another part of my sort of finding my new self. And I talked to Hadassah groups, I talked to you know, Hillel groups, whatever. So in some ways, my way out of my, the hole that I had fallen into um, was through thinking about things in an original way and then going out into the uh, public and speaking about them and interacting with people. And all of a sudden I started to say, I guess that I do have a self now. It's, it's starting to come out. So a lot of that was really building of a, of a self. Yeah. And it was a hard decade. It really was. Are you still talking about the 60s? That was still in the uh, 60s? No, this was in the 70s. Into the 70s. So I want to take us back to uh, the beginnings of your involvement with Chavarat Shalom. You've, you've sort of sketched out what happened over the next few years. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to this moment in 69, when you and Everett had come back from Cuernavaca, right, Mexico. Yeah, we, I thought it was 1970 when we came back, but maybe it was 69. It was 69. Okay. And, uh, and we're first, and we're living at Packard Mance with your mm -hmm. two young children, and he was getting involved with the Chavara. Um I wanted to ask what you recall as the, your f first sort of impressions of the Chavara. Did you start visiting the Chavara? Um, 
and and what are your earliest memories that sort of revolve around the Chavra itself? Well, let me just go back a tiny bit on that. Everett had come, made a trip from Mexico, and he was looking at a couple of things, and one was at the Havara, and the other was at this uh, retreat center in, in Stoughton. Packard Mance. And Packard Mance. So he was trying to scout out what might be the best for us. And his interest in the hover, I mean, he was, uh, art was very close to him, and they very much wanted him to come. And I remember uh, we looked in places in Somerville and just thought, oh, we can't live in the city. This is just, can't do it. Whereas we were living in the middle of a woods and on a meadow in, in Stoughton. Um, I think another piece of it uh, was that, um, I mean, this would, would have been, was totally Everett's thing. It really was not my thing. Um, uh, all the, the, you know, the people knew him as, as, you know, a teacher and respecting, and I was just sort of like tagging along into a world I had no consciousness of before. I had never heard Davni before. I'd never heard the word Davni. Uh, I mean, this was just, uh, just, just like outer space for me. How, how would you have described your own Jewish identity at that at that point? How would I have described it? I as I have always felt it. I feel surprisingly Jewish, given all of the, uh, in the sort of, in the community work and life that I've had, given that it was reform. I have always felt uh, a very strong Jewish identity. But it wasn't matching anything that I was seeing in the Havura. Was there anything about what you knew of the Havura before you were really involved, just as you were getting involved, that felt, felt appealing to you? Or it really felt like it was Everett's thing? Indifferent, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was Everett's thing. I mean, a, a whole Jewish community where you would live? No, that was not me. Did you envision any involvement for yourself uh, personally and with the girls? Well, w in the early years when we used to visit, uh, it was actually very awkward because we were the only ones who had children. Everybody else was younger. When you younger. used to visit, you mean whenever it was involved? Yeah, whenever, yes. So, so you would visit? With yeah, girls. we would come up and I, I think there... It's, a lot of it is really hazy uh, for me, but we would come up for something or other. Um, it was like an hour's drive from Stoughton. And the problem was if we go to services, I mean, what are you gonna do with a two-year-old and a four-year-old? I mean, they're gonna run around, they're gonna talk and whatever. And so they were, you know, disruptive. And that, was, that would have been disturbing and disruptive to people. To them, yes, yes. This was a very serious group of people, very serious. Mm -hmm. Um, especially about the, the Davni. And uh, so it, it never really was my place at all. I made some friends there, and a lot of the people I still know were from there. How did you make friends there? Uh, well, I think we went to, you were asking about Weiss's farm. We went to Weiss's farm, and um, so I remember getting to know people. It's all astonishingly hazy for me. Uh, that whole period, and uh, <sighs> did you ever go to Shabbat morning services there? We were at some services, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, I couldn't be at the service. It was all down I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know what they were talking about. A this very had very different world. Uh, just com completely different world. I mean, more different to me than it had been going to France from America. I mean, it was like another world. Did it affect your sense of what it meant to be Jewish? Positively or negatively? Uh, it broadened it, I guess. I, I said, oh, I guess this is how other Jews do it. I mean, my whole world had been Reformed Judaism. So um, it, it certainly was broadening, but it, it was not something that I uh, felt I wanted to do or learn how to do. Yeah, so it wasn't appealing. No, it wasn't. It was more, it made me uncomfortable. This was a period, as you were just describing, where you were becoming increasingly aware of feminist issues mm -hmm. um, and the relationships between men and women. Did you have a sense that other women connected to the Chavura were also going through some kind of transition and increasing awareness? Well, apparently, and I don't remember this, but Sharon Strasswell said, I really brought that in. 
um, because I came in with my awareness about women and th that hadn't really been going on for them. And uh, she also said we had a women's group for a while. Then you started. Then, then you I started. I don't remember. She said it fizzled very quickly. <laughs> well, yes. It, they, you know, they were younger women, and they didn't have kids, so they didn't understand. It's, I mean, it's one thing if you're, if you're married, okay, you may end up doing the cooking that you didn't think you should do. Once you've got kids, your life is totally different because they are 24 hours a day. And so uh, for the 12 or 15 hours they're up, whose responsibility is to take care of them? And it's a s totally different world. Mm. Were you involved in, in Jewish life yourself during this period? That's when I was doing all this writing about Jewish women and biblical women. And so, yes, I was very involved in it because I was, I was uh, thinking about it. I was learning about these, these historical uh, figures. And then I was going out and I was talking and... Uh, so, as a matter of fact, my life was very Jewishly involved at that point, but not in the same way that, say, had I been a real member of Havarat Shalom. Were there other contexts in which your family and you were sort of able to live an, an active Jewish life within a community? Well, yeah. I mean, after we were two years in Stoughton, and then in 73, we moved up to, or 72, we moved up to Andover, and Everett had a congregation in Lowell, and it was a wonderful group of people. It was filled with people who couldn't stand regular synagogues. So they would come from all, all over the area, and a very independent-minded, uh, reform uh, backgrounds, and uh, very outgoing. I mean, when we were in Princeton, nobody would talk to us about anything but religion. You know, it was like, but if they knew we were, they knew Everett was a person in, uh, in uh, Lowell. So that really, uh, I mean, those were fabulous years. I mean, like 30 years. I, I loved the congregation. And as we were leaving, I said to Everett, you know, when we're going, I'd like to have a party and I'd like to invite so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. He said, do you realize you just named the board? And I said, what? Then they take it back. I mean, it was like I wasn't going to do this Robinson thing. But it it's shows you how they were our close friends. So that became, I mean, that was just wonderful, wonderful. Uh, these, just, my, just my level. And these were people who had families also. Oh, yes, 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 yes. One of the critiques that's been um, directed at the Chavura is that it, it wasn't, really a sustainable model for Jewish life because mm -hmm. it was basically composed of young people, mainly men, mm -hmm. in their 20s, mm -hmm. unmarried, men, single, most of them, some of them with girlfriends, a few, a few who were just there recently were some married, married yeah. but they weren't dealing with the realities of family life, right. careers and jobs and all of that. They could focus entirely on this. Mm -hmm. Sounds like in this environment in Lowell, you were able to find a group of people who were well, it was, with it was just families. similar. It was just plain families, not, you know, uh, I, I always thought of Havara as being a super, super duper religious place, you know, and it was just all of this religious stuff going on all the time. And it just wasn't where I lived or where I've ever lived in, inside of me. Judaism has been important. It sometimes astonishes me how firmly my identity is Jewish, but it, it, it's back to sort of the way I was raised, which is all different kinds of friends and people, but a very a wonderful place where I could practice my spirituality and my Judaism, a group of people that I felt very comfortable with. And um, whenever it went up to interview to this place, they were, he decided he was going to lay everything out. You know, I'm against the war. I've collected draft cards. I, I, da, da, da. And one of the women said, Rabbi, what you do is your own business. We're not going to tell you what to do. And we were going home and I said, Ever take it. Just take it, take it, take it. Because it was, um, it was just really turned out to be 
totally compatibly our, our place yeah. and, and my place. Art Green, in a, in a very recent uh, article in Packentrager, which is the publication of the, the Yiddish Book Center, characterized this very early period at the Chavara as pre-women's movement, pre-feminist mm -hmm. consciousness. It sounds like that was, in fact, the case. It was until I came along. Yeah. Was that true in this other community that you were getting involved with also? Oh, no, there were a lot of with it people mm -hmm. here. Um, it was also a couple of years later. And it was a couple of years later, and I had really, I, we, I and we had worked through some of the, the hardest part of it. Mm -hmm. so, what does that mean, you'd work through some of the hardest parts? Well, I mean, we had a lot of negotiating to do in our family, Everett and I. As did many families. You know, <laughs> I mean, like, I know how important you are, and I know how you're saving the world, and I know I'm feeling guilty, but damn, I get something, too. I get some time. Uh, I deserve some time. And so there was a negotiation around that, and... Um, Everett is as nice as they come, but he was raised a Jewish male, and he was raised with that entitlement. Yeah. And uh, it was very, very hard for him to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so th we just kept hanging in there and, you know, and doing things. And eventually, eventually what really changed it for him was he realized that he really wanted to have time with his children when they were little. He didn't want them to just grow up without him. And over the years, he's become so, so closely uh, uh, tied with them. And he thanks me very much for, uh, for my nudging, because he wouldn't have had that otherwise. During the same period when you were starting to find your own voice, Jewish women were starting to, on a broader scale too, at least mm -hmm. uh, the founding of Ezra Nashim, Right. occurred in New York in 71, mm -hmm. followed by a couple of conferences in New York City that mm -hmm. drew hundreds of people mm -hmm. um, over the following years. Were you aware of those or yeah. interested in them? Yeah, I, I knew them. I didn't, I didn't go, but I did know of them, sure. Did you find any women to talk to uh, who were also involved? And, and you had tried within the Chabura to start something. That didn't work. Did you find Jewish women who were interested in exploring... Well, I was this in th various groups. I, I think they may have been in Boston, though. Uh, were they, any of them, oriented towards Jewish life at all? Not that I So these were general remember. consciousness raising. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you were finding this within yourself, it sounds like, yes. to bring it out into the world. What kind of a reception were you getting among them, women? Uh, it was good. It was yeah. good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember at one point, speaking to a sisterhood, and I was like, sisterhoods, what are these people? Are they going to be so boring or whatever? There were several older women there, and it was like, go, go, girl, go. They were just fabulous. And so that sort of shook that prejudice out of my mind. And, uh, <laughs> and it was affirming because people, people listened, people appreciated what I was saying. So it was, it was a very affirming experience. You thought of something else from your childhood that you oh. wanted to mention. Yeah, about, about uh, how Jewish I felt. This was, I was at this private school, Sunset Hill School for Girls, and there was an un, unaffirmed or unnamed uh, quota for Jews, which I figured out when I was like 10th grade. It was like there were two Jews per class, and they were almost always the top two uh, uh, the smartest. And so I think it was maybe in, I don't know what year, but we had this wonderful, wonderful drama teacher and we were going to put on a Christmas play. So I had this long hair and I was small and she said, Mary, wouldn't you like to play the Christ child? And it's like she, she was so sweet that she didn't even think about it. And I said, you know, that really would make me very uncomfortable. I don't think so. So I ended up being, uh, the other Jewish girl and myself ended up being a couple who were sitting down to dinner to have something. And our resistance was, we sat down and we went, and, then, and it was just like this little rebellious act and uh, a sense of saying, 
no, this is who I am. And uh, I've never forgotten that. That's, that's great. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to add about your experiences directly with the Chavarot during this period? You know, it all seems so vague to me. We did go to Weiss, some of Weiss's farms. Uh, one of my main memories, however, is of our, our children running around chasing fireflies and, and, and there, and, that, and people sort of thought that was cute. Um, no, I, I don't know why it is such tabula rasa for me, uh, whether I really, it was so not right for me that I just sort of tamped it all down. There, there must be something of that, because I know that a number of the people we have become very close friends with. Oh, here's the funniest one. So Joe, Joe Reamer was a member of the Hub. At age 40, I decided I was going back to school to get my doctorate in psychology. Who becomes my advisor? Joe. Joey Reamer. So it was so funny to have to do with him, because he was younger than I am. So having this other reversal uh, was, was really, really funny. Yeah. Uh, and we had been friends, and we are friends now afterwards, but yeah. <laughs> it was really funny. So you went on just to give people uh, a little picture of what, what else you were doing with your life. You did go on to become a psychologist. Yes. And just tell us very briefly about your career. Well, actually, my career in psychology started earlier. I got a master's in counseling from Antioch. But my family always said I was just always in school, and it really was a lot of that. So I had been running groups, and I had uh, worked at um, mental health centers. But I wanted to have a real legitimate degree. And so, um, and so I did, and I was, it was... It was partly uh, private practice. For several years, I was the clinical director at a Jewish family service um, in, in Lawrence, near where we lived. And um, uh, I had pub uh, private practice and working there. So that was over a period of 20 years, at least. And um, in, in 95, Everett was ready to retire. And, I was getting so sick of this, the the billing stuff with the with the uh, psychologist. I mean, I I just couldn't wait to get the managed care stuff. I could not wait to get away from that because it was just infuriating and eating up my time and whatever. So I decided I would leave too. But I, I partly that doctorate was what I I wanted to prove I could do it, that I could really get a doctorate, and so. I w we were up all night. My two girls were in the uh, in the high school at that time, so we used to have tea in in the kitchen in the middle of the night, you know, periodically. So, so it it was it was very good and, and important to me that I had that. And, and and did you find your career as a psychologist fulfilling? Yes, until the managed care came along. Yeah. Uh, really seriously. I the work of it. As yes, to the, the work of it. Pieces. The the first part was very hard because I lived. I was working in this community mental health center, and the, I mean, just the lives that people lead and the things that were happening and whatever, and that was very depressing. And I had to learn to just not take it home because it would make me sick. Uh, and then I was working with more, you know, the Jewish community and whatever, and that felt like just easy compared to, to what I had been doing before. But yes, I really liked being a psychotherapist. I, I really did. Especially I liked working with children and, uh, and families. But I did it all, individual groups, whatever. Great. So yes, that was, that was a very fulfilling thing to do. In this concluding section, I want to focus on your thoughts about how this period of involvement in Chavarat Shalom affected other aspects of your life moving forward and your reflections on the broader impact of the Chabara uh, on Jewish life as well as your own Jewish life uh, in America. So just to recapitulate, you were actively involved in the Chabara from 1969 to 72. And um, at that point, Everett, you took a, a pulpit in, in Marblehead? Lowell. Lowell. In Lowell. Um, it, and the commitment there was half time. That had been a temple that always took pride in running its own affairs. They wanted a rabbi. 
They wanted someone to teach, uh, to lead services, but they wanted to manage it. And so um, I didn't have to attend board meetings. In fact, they preferred that I not. And that certainly coincided with my preference. So, uh, but yes, I, I then became involved with that. And then in from 76 to 95, I was part of an ecumenical chaplaincy and taught philosophy and religious studies at Phillips Academy, a, a resident, a boarding school, nine through 12 in Andover. Prep school in Andover. Yeah, a prep, a prep school. Did you continue to be actively involved in developments in, in the Chabara movement in the following years? Um, I would say somewhat. We a couple of times we went to National Chavura Institutes, and my my own way of um, doing a, you know conducting prayers and and uh, running the temple, the parts of it that, that I was responsible for, were very much Chavura style. Okay. In in Lowell, for example, um, my predecessor wore a, a gown, <laughs> a, a robe, a black robe, and stood on the bima. I arranged the chairs in a semicircle, and I sat with the congregation every week. I, not, not at the high holidays, but at every other service. So um, just sitting with them uh, already uh, represented, I think, some of the Chavura spirit. Now uh, leavening previously lumpy congregational life. So I guess I always thought of myself as either contributing to or working alongside the, the trends that I think uh, the Chavura movement contributed to the enrichment and really the salvation of American Judaism. Can, also, you, can you articulate, either one of you, um, beyond the sort of sitting in a circle, yeah, uh, uh, and being oh. sort of down off the bima as as the rabbi, other any other aspects of chavura Judaism, what you what you think of as chavura Judaism, that felt in, important for you to continue both to teach mm -hmm. and to incorporate into your own lives. Well, I don't know. I assume you talked about the Marblehead group. I, I just mentioned, but oh, nothing. in in a sense, we we were part of a chavura. Um, there were six families, and five of them were from Marblehead, and they just could not bear the way Judaism was going to be practiced or taught in uh, synagogues. And somehow they found Everett. I don't know, they read some... Art, Art, uh, Art Green referred them. They read about Chavarat Shalom, and I had just written that article, uh, Is There an Alternative to Synagogue? And Art referred them to me. So we actually were... Together, uh, oh, it was 13, 14 years. years. Thir no, exactly. I remember because as is classically the case, at 13 you drop out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was, it was couples with young families, just almost same ages, all, all of us together. And we would meet like maybe monthly. And uh, it was always, you know, just sort of not the standard ways of, of celebrating, but making up our own traditions. And do you, do you remember some of the, well, I'll tell oh. you, the one I liked best was the second day of Rosh Hashanah. We all went to um, the, the beach, Plum, uh, Island. Plum Island, and got there before sunrise. And then as the sun came up, we blow the shofar and chant and uh, uh, sing and whatever. And then we'd have a picnic and we and we'd stay and well, we did that for a long time and it was it's, very it, important to us and our children our children remember it but that service and we began doing it uh, with Marblehead because but my congregation was a one day Rosh Hashanah congregation so I didn't have to be anywhere and uh, 
birthday of the world and so on. And uh, it, we, we did that. And besides uh, sounding the shofar, eventually people would bring drums and Mary would bring a Tibetan prayer horn. And always after that, with the sun coming up, we'd all sing, morning has broken. And then we'd have uh, readings and reflections and a traditional sounding of the shofar. And then, weather permitting, you know, picnic, shared breakfast, and it, it was beautiful. Th then members of my temple wanted to join in, so they came, and that still continues. Do you know Temple Emanuel of the Merrimack They're Valley? They're still doing that? They still, second morning Rosh cool. Hashanah, pre-sunrise gathering at Plum Island. We haven't talked about the Jewish but, catalog, which was published in 73, originally, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. several other editions. Did that, were you able to make use of that? Did it have any impact oh, on oh, your life and, and your, your, your work with I, your community? I contributed several articles. Mary contributed one on tzedakah, and... Uh, of course, I mean, that was a basic text. I mean, it was, you know, at one time, for somebody very traditional, you might refer them to the uh, abbreviated Shulchan Aruch in English. Uh, you referred them to the Jewish catalog, volumes one, two, or three, or all of the above. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it was really a do-it-yourself manual, absolutely. As I say, uh, certainly that spirit infused um, our own our own services at Temple Emanuel. Here, I'll give you a couple more examples. You, you ask about you know my relation to the Chavura movement. Um, I'd say the movement still has some catching up to do. For example. We had annually a, a May Day Lagba Omer ceremony up in our field in Andover. We had a two acre hay field besides our garden. And I would every year cut a fresh 18 foot sapling and trim it, attach to it 18 colored ribbons. I made a special crown for it with biblical verses and something from E.E. E. Cummings and uh, and um, yeah and Chaucer, and we would have a ritual procession around the field, and at each directional point, a flag would be planted with either a verse from. Kohelet from Ecclesiastes, referring to North and South, or from um, Song of Songs, East and West, or the reverse. And then we put up the maypole and uh, do the ribbons. And you know, there are still people I meet who say, I remember as a kid coming with my parents to your Omer May Day celebration. So there was a lot of innovation. For example, um, it, it, it's too long for the tape, but my temple came to observe Jacob Lantern Sabbath, the last Friday night in October. And I, I have a whole thing about pumpkins, but we... Uh, I, uh, I, we illuminate our sukkah with a carved pumpkin. Certainly is more authentic than an electric light if you want to talk about desert illumination. So, uh, you know, but our small temple, the last few years of Jacob Lantern service had an average number of more than 50 Five oh, carved pumpkins on the bima, everyone with a candle, 
and the service was awesome and standard, but then a period of reflection and darkness and the organist playing and associations with the light and rays and emanations. And, I mean, it's incredible. We also had very big emphasis on the two Bishvat Seder, for which I think correctly I am, I am credited with having a not initiated, but certainly brought it to wider attention. So I, I like, and also, and this has not yet been adopted, but hang around a few generations and it will be, we made a sun wheel at our temple. And we, I had the collaboration of a wonderful artist from, uh, from from Newton, actually, a woman named Karen Frosty, mm -hmm. who taught at Mass. Do you, Do you know, know her? her? Oh, she's a fabulous, very gifted. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, she helped me design a sun wheel for the, the great sun ceremony uh, on uh, Wednesday morning, April 8th. It, it, it was in... Uh, 1981, and it's celebrated once every 28 years. Anyway, the sun wheel is on four feet in diameter with a Hebrew acrostic, and I'll show you a photo of it if you're interested. And um, what do you do with a four foot in diameter decorated wheel? But you know, that fits on a closet pole, and so it, you can turn it and make, for the turn. Well, I realized this is what we need at every turning of the seasons. And ever since 1981, and it is still used four times a year at a temple, there is some poetry and a blessing and a proclamation of the succession of the seasons, and then some music, and always turn, 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 and the turning of the prayer, the sun wheel. Now, so I mean, I think of all of these as of participating in the spirit of Havara Judaism. I have a question. Uh, yeah. We, Do you think of other things, Mary? Uh, no. We're talking about the spirit of do-it-yourself Judaism. Yeah. That was sort of encapsulated and in the catalog by the catalog, and at the same time, the Chavara, the original Chavara, the first Chavara, and the Chavara Judaism. Um, had had begun with, among other things, a, a very strong critique of the quote sterility of services in in sort of big box uh, Jewish synagogues and mm -hmm. particularly the role of the rabbi. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how you sort of came to uh, articulate for yourself and envision the role of the rabbi as you saw it and as you wanted to live it uh, in this new context, mm -hmm. which quite required people, or called for people to participate much more fully themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I very much thought of myself as essentially a resource person, someone who could help people give expression to some of their inner stirrings with the aid of traditional Jewish practices, perhaps modified, adjusted, reinterpreted for a particular occasion. So. I, I did not view myself as the authority to which people came 
for directive decisions, but rather as an enabler of expression of deeper feelings. You know, the idea of, oh, well, I don't want to be impeded by traditional forms of expression. I want to give expression to my own individual thought. If we were all capable of such inspired expression of what lies within, the world would know no prose, only poetry. Most of us are not so gifted. And part of the genius of Jewish tradition is the ceremonies that can give expression to these deep layers of feeling. So always, and it's still the case, my, my sense of being a rabbi was making available to people what uh, they may not be aware of, helping them appreciate the flexibility, the fluidity of these forms that are not fixed, absolutely, and helping them realize what a treasure they have for relating what lies within to being shared with others. Oh. At some level, I think, uh, what we're really talking about is enable, enabling uh, speech an expression to unite us around our inner lives. Mary, in a, in a similar, somewhat similar vein, it strikes me that part of what Chabura Judaism did, at least in the beginning, was sort of identifying in very personal ways the voids and the lacks in, mm -hmm. in, in Jewish life and ritual, mm -hmm. and taking it upon oneself, understanding that you had the agency, you yourself had the agency to try and change what mm -hmm. was not working for you. Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, what you're describing about the impact of feminism and how you took that and moved with it into an exploration of your own Jewish life and then sharing it exemplifies exactly mm. that. Does mm. that sort of mm. speak to you? Does that ring yeah. true? Yeah, yeah. It, it probably made me more involved with Judaism than I would have been. Uh, uh, when, when the feminist movement first came along, I was just thinking of it as, you know, sort of, our household, the kids, and whatever, but um, I, I, in some way, I think that being involved with the Havara uh, helped to move that along. And I think my and the way the direction I took it was in exploring what is Judaism anyway. What is all this stuff? And uh, does any of it? Do I relate to any of it? Is it any of it? you know, work in my life and how my life. And that's, I think, how I then got into writing about women of the Bible and, and ri new Jewish rituals for, for people. And, and actually exploring what some of those metaphors were, classic metaphors mm -hmm. for the women's voices. Yes. Um, which was really in the vanguard of what Jewish feminist scholarship and exploration of ri ritual and the... And the innovation of new rituals that spoke specifically to women's lives. Mm -hmm. And you got involved in that too. Actually, I, I don't want to brag, but I think I was the first one who started writing and speaking about that. Certainly not the most famous, not the best known, but I, something came out in 1970. And so far as I know, it was in response, there were, that was the first. Uh, something of yours. Yes, yeah, something of mine came out. And um, so, uh, but, uh, but then it you know, sort of spread and it became, and people got more and more involved and more and more of the analyses. But um, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, 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 yeah. yeah let, let me, I, I just thought of one other thing, you know, the sensitivity to the environment and so on that I had begun to articulate. You know, it was in 1978 that our temple in Lowell converted mm. our eternal light to solar power. 1978, very powerful symbolic act, people still appreciate it. I mean, fossil fuels, I mean, nuclear, I mean, eternal, be real. Uh, I mean, once upon a time, the olive, that was totally renewable. Sun, you know, over how many billion years, but it'll do as eternal source. And to plug your symbolic ner tamid into the sun, wow, that. Do you, do you see the, uh, the evolution of Jewish environmentalism of recent, of recent times as a direct sort of outgrowth of these early efforts that you were in so many ways responsible for nurturing? I, I, I would hope that it contributed. Many I, I, people call you now the father of Jewish in, environmentalism. Or the grandfather, the grand, as I, I, I But I, I, for a long time, he was, he was not appreciated. Everett has tread along the edges for so many years, and uh, people sort of go, uh, and then, and then they eventually find out, oh, yeah, that's wonderful, that's it. So, uh, I mean, he was really coming out with that. Even when we were at Packard Mance, um, we uh, sponsored a weekend on, on uh, environmentalism and all of that. And um, it, it was just the beginning of that kind of awareness. And, and you spoke earlier about your, your view from the margins, in a sense, um, and also your roots. Mm. Oh yes. The farms, the farms, and the landscape, yeah. and the yeah. soils of, of Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would add, by the way, and I, I've not been active in it. I mean, I've always been a member, but the the growth of vegetarianism within Judaism, and I, I mean, I was, came to that very early. How did you come to that? Oh, a combination of. Um, some bib the, the biblical Genesis account, um, a, a romantic period when Chinese nature poetry and Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde would, was dominant, and uh, we, uh, I had known a, a wonderful old couple in Maine, Helen and Scott Nearing, who were vegetarians. I'd, Do you know of them? Back to the land movement. They were very important Pioneers. in our life. Very, very important. important. I mean, Can you say I, a few words about that, please? Um, and then I, when, when I went to the Quaker um, summer camp when I, uh, when I was in high school for a week, um, uh, it, kids on that campus, William Penn College in Oskaloosa, were very excited about a newsletter published by some guy named Scott Nearing. And I registered it, and then when I was studying at University of Chicago, I noticed that uh, Scott Nearing was speaking at uh, some public hall on the near north side of Chicago. It, its nickname was Hobo College. A lot of, you know, fringy types would sound off there. Anyway, I went and I met Scott in 1946 and then uh, maintained contact with him and with Helen and I, they were always influential and they had been vegetarians so they and, um, and Louis Finkelstein was another contributor to my vegetarianism because at a certain point, I, I did not find kashrut uh, compatible. 
And uh, he said, how so? Can you say uh, it was irrational. Uh, what was the point? A lot of it was intended to keep us from excessive contact with those who ate differently, and I wanted more contact. But it, it, it just didn't, didn't make sense. There were elements of it, uh, s considerate slaughter, okay. But anyway, I can remember talking with Finkelstein and he was saying, look, he said, I, I can understand that you find Kashrut incomplete, he said, but given your general values and your sensitivities, uh, why are you eating meat at all? Why aren't you a vegetarian? And that was a powerful question from, uh, and I thought about it and so slowly made the transition. And uh, I don't know, what is it, 55, 57 years, so could become habitual. <laughs> <laughs> and Everett was vegetarian when I met him, and I had grown up in Kansas City, second largest stockyards of the country, <laughs> meat, uh, you know, beef and pork chops and everything, uh, heavily meat eater. Um, and we met, I'd never even really heard about vegetarians, whatever. But however, it was, uh, I really am so grateful he was vegetarian and not with kashrut because I couldn't have done it. I, I could not ever have kept kosher. It, if you thought it didn't make sense, to me it was just, <laughs> just you know, this voodoo stuff and obsessive. And you know, you get, you get this, this, this glass and this piece of uh, silverware and this, this sponge and that, I mean, just, Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and I was saying, you know, had you, had you been kosher, I'm not sure this whole thing would have happened. I mean, I really, I, that sounds really extreme, but we first visit to his mother. I used the wrong glass. She said, that's okay, we'll bury it. I'm 23 years old, and she's like, <sighs> and I thought, this is really bad stuff. <laughs> so, whereas veget I always loved animals, and vegetarianism made uh, perfect, perfect sense to me. So we, uh, when we were first married, uh, I, I would be a uh, vegetarian at home. We'd go out and I would eat meat. Then one summer, Ever took a bunch of youth groupers up to Maine, and we went to see the Nearings. It was my first time seeing the Nearings. And they didn't proselytize, they didn't anything. They were just them. And I remember going back to the camp, it was a USY camp, and getting the hamburger and sitting in the corner and wolfing it down to my last meat for, it's been 52 years, or something like that. So they were very powerful influence. I'll just say a little more about that. Uh, when we came back from, from uh, Mexico, Everett had uh, talked about them and said, uh, well, why don't we go up and spend three weeks up there and they can teach us how to garden. Well, uh, we were not staying with them, they would say, thank God. But, and I had two little ones and Helen was somebody who was always on the move. So I, they'd be in the kitchen, she'd like run them over, you know, zoom, zoom, zoom. So uh, <laughs> fortunately we brought a babysitting along. But anyway, they become very, very important in our lives. And um, it's hard for me to say all the ways, but just sort of, who they were, how they were living out their values, how, um, uh, you know, the, the, when they talked about things, that, that was how they lived and that was how they did. More extreme than would be right for me. I mean, I, I really did not go for the Clivus Multrum uh, toilet, which is self-composting. And, you know, I'm a little too bourgeois for that. But, but uh, <laughs> But the, the sort of, just the idea of, you know, you're living your principles and you're growing your own food. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they became very important. And Helen especially was important for me. Um, it's hard for me to say why, but uh -oh. I don't know. I, I absorbed a lot of Helen, but in, mm. in my own way. Mm. Uh -oh. In, oh, t what? yes, no, totally. <laughs> what totally was that? The, uh? the, no, the <laughs> energy, <laughs> yes, the... The energy, the vitality, the eternal youthfulness, the, the, the continued activity 
undeterred by aging, all of that you exemplified, she darling. She camped you... with us when she was 93, right over there. She did say she was, felt, didn't feel comfortable bathing in the stream, but she camped with us. Well, there, it was very hazardous footing. But, but you know, it, it, it was just a whole approach to life and, you know, living your values and uh, practicing them. Uh, and there was, she, she was just a very important role model for me. Uh, Scott was a bit stiff and gruff. And <clears throat> occasionally he would smile. But uh, she was just effervescent and, and whatever. And <laughs> really, really an important archetypal figure in, in my mind yeah. for me. Look, the difference between Helen and Scott, you can, you can summarize it this way. Helen at one time had played the violin, quite accomplished, not quite professional level, but might have had aspirations and might have made it. And she loved music, and so do I, especially classical music. So we, but the, um, so once in a while, Helen would purchase a record just so she could hear something. And uh, she loved that. And Scott would say, you've already heard it. <laughs> Are you playing it again? I mean, there you have it. <laughs> Whereas we'd come up and we would invariably take her to one of the Sunday concerts at Kneisel Hall in Blue Hill, Maine, and she would be in ecstasy. Okay. Let's Coming see. back to the Hummerah. Yes. yes. It, um, Sorry, wandering a bit. No, it was ah. important. Um, and looking at the Chavarad's vision for community, for mm. prayer, for social justice, for the role of learning both in one's own life uh, and, and communally, what would you say were, were the Chavarad's greatest strengths? I think from the fact that there may be no synagogue currently operating that does not have Chavurot within it, I would say there was, first of all, the early recognition of how essential community is to individual development and the devastation of community in the U.S. Uh, I mean, and the anomie, and the despair, and the rootlessness, and the lack of value. I would say Chavurat Shalom and the Chavurah movement early recognized the importance of companionship, fellowship, human sharing. For me, the, the great strength of the Chavurah movement is its religiosity, its religious focus. Because I, I think that the purely horizontal is not self-sustaining. One needs the vertical, whether heights or depths. And the Chavira movement um, recognized that. I mean, William Blake, put it perfectly, he said, he has a little epigrammatic essay, a few lines, it's called, There is no natural religion. Nature is entropy, it, it, it slides downhill. Energy is slowly drained. You need the inspiration. I think the, the seriousness of, of the quest, the spiritual quest at Chavurat Shalom is also a beacon and uh, the spirituality and the Jewish meditation movement and all of that and a more reflective, devotional oriented group of younger rabbis. I th I don't say that's a direct influence, but that those developments reflect 
what the Chavura early perceived as uh, the crucial need for our continuation. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Is there anything else either of you would like to add? There is one thing that I didn't mention, um, which is uh, my passion for the out of doors. And that, mm. in some ways, grew out of my summer experience uh, at Ch Camp Chikagami, that I really love the outdoors. And I have really come to feel that that is my spiritual home. It's with growing things, with, uh, I mean, I can go out and I'll spend 12 hours a day and not even know that it's gone, just doing this and that, and then be totally happy. I totally, totally at home. So uh, I, I have really come to feel there's, there's where I express, my, express and receive my spirituality. Uh, w when I observe Mary um, cutting flowers, and then contemplating them, she probably wouldn't use the word, and uh, arranging them uh, so artistically. I mean, it, it, I recognize it as really a very high, advanced form of worship, of tefillah. And look, tefillah is, after all, ultimately uh, connected with a root having to do with connection. And it, that is her deep connection you know, to roots, branches, and efflorescence. And uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm touched just observing it. So I think when she says that, uh, it, it's a true expression of her, her worship. However, even the term might be on her tongue. Don't get too sappy about all of this. No. <laughs> One other thing that I would uh, note, even as we've been having this last uh, conversation, is the uh, orientation towards what, once again, Art Green called the patch patchwork creativity, the sense that all the world, in a sense, uh, mm. is for us to draw on in our own worship, in our communal worship. And this was something that certainly animated the early Chavarot, seems to have animated your whole approach to, to, yeah. to the rabbinate, mm -hmm. your approach to life as well. And um, do you see that as having sort of filtered into as, as a legacy of, uh, or an outgrowth of the Chavurah and Chavurah Judaism into the larger Jewish world? Um, I didn't experience the, the Chavurah movement as uh, really living that out. It certainly subscribed to it intellectually, but that's not where I, I felt the emphasis was. I, I found it much more on reclaiming the authentic Jewish tradition. Um, what was your, what's your sense, Mary? My sense of the Havara is so vague and oh, so... Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, uh, but yes, I found it, it, there was a way in which I found it too Jewish. Mm -hmm. Well, again, that's my reform background, but uh, it was just so intensely focused on Judaism and Jewish. And that to me was too narrow. Mm -hmm. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fit in, the, in that. Zalman was way out there. But I don't think the Chavura movement was. Maybe that's a place where they departed, Zalman. I think the emphasis that they they may have uh, they may have subscribed theoretically to the same principles, but in practice, I I would say there was a a significant divide. I, you put it very well. 
Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a remarkable conversation. We're very grateful to you. <laughs> Both, we hope we haven't worn you out. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, oh come on. We we've just only walked be... around Machu Picchu. Let's, <laughs> we've only let's begun to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're on our way to Iran. I mean, you know, life's... That's right, life's, and you just found out about the trip last week. That's right. 